very warm good morning and uh, good morning good afternoon and uh, good evening for uh, people coming people joining us from various part of the globe and it's a wonderful uh, day to begin again so we had a wonderful sessions yesterday and uh, it's very exciting to start another day afresh and with a in fact unlike last yesterday it was a very focused discussion and today we have a very wide variety of uh, speakers and wide variety of topics lined up for an exciting sessions and uh, uh, just to give a brief uh, background about the today's uh, webinar uh, today the theme of the webinar is as you can see from the background mangroves for coastal resilience and biodiversity conservation the idea behind conceiving this theme is to get some contemporary ideas regarding you know ma management of mangroves and conservation issues around mangroves as well as the recent research that are happening on mangrove ecosystems uh, especially in the e ecosystem or ecological aspects so uh, we have a lot of studies done on these aspects however there are so much of uh, as uh, yesterday uh, highlighted by uh, some of the panelists as well as the keynote speaker there are quite a lot of interesting studies that that yet to be done as far as indian mangroves are concerned so uh, so uh, you could see that today we have a like i said very wide variety of topics and uh, we hope we will have a very interesting sessions and i i thank everybody for joining us and uh, today we have with us uh, dr shivakumar uh, for uh, it's a honor to have you in the uh, webinar and uh, so uh, without further ado i like to uh, invite him to deliver the welcome address so just a brief introduction about uh, dr shiv kumar uh, he is uh, one among the you no know, hardcore conservationist in the country and uh, he is a fact, uh, he is a scientist f at wildlife institute of india having more than two, uh, close to three decades of experience in biodiversity research and uh, uh, his uh, by uh, his brief bio is there in the website i hope everybody can have a look at it and uh, without wasting much time i i uh, thank him for joining us please the floor is yours sir uh, thank you dr neeru prabhagaran uh, namaskar everybody good morning good afternoon and good evening as dr neeru mentioned we will be at, for attending this webinar from all over from the country uh it is really immense pleasure in fact uh, to uh, welcome you all on behalf of the wildlife institute of india and uh, center for international forest research institute so these are the two organizations uh, came forward to together to organize this was wonderful webinar uh mangrove all of you aware uh, it is a, one of the wonderful uh, ecosystem habitat and uh, it gives lot of uh, benefits to the human kind as well as to the entire ecosystems which around that mangrove system all of you are aware of that but i don't want to talk more about that but i will give you a small experience which i had personally uh, observed this issues and i was always thinking about how to address this issue in the future that is you may be aware india has about around 6000 uh, 5000 square kilometer of mangroves and majority of them are in the east coast of india as well as andaman and we too have a good mangroves in the west coast but in the northern part of the west coast uh, maharashtra and gujarat we have they are good and then coming down to the southern part of the west coast we don't have much mangroves similarly in the east coast also when you move towards equator that mangroves are slightly less probably uh, might have destroyed by the community in the past nevertheless uh, i had a one experience working with the the second largest mangrove uh, system of our country that's called a koringa uh, the koringa mangroves actually the habitat created by the the second largest river uh, india that is called a godavari river so the river mouth the godavari river meets the bay of bengal that is the northern indian version uh it meets there where it these huge mangroves about uh, uh, 800 square kilometer area of the mangroves was created uh when i spent about 5 6 years to understand the value of this mangrove how it actually significant to this 
community who are living that area. And then what could happen uh, because of this ongoing climate uh, impact on the system and all those things. And uh, very interesting information I got, although they say that this mangrove is one of the very, very critical ecosystem for India uh, to accommodate the one of the critically endangered uh, fishing cat. That is uh, because we give a lot of importance to tiger in, in India, but we don't give much importance to the smaller cats. The one of the smaller cat and that to the endangered cat is the fishing cat. Not only the fishing cat, we had a good population otter. So many other biodiversity are still thriving in this particular uh, mangrove habitat. That is a value to the biodiversity. But when I went in depth, then I realized there was a strong link, uh, almost about 100,000 families are directly or indirectly depend on this particular mangrove and the adjoining estuarine systems. Now the issue here is when I was looking for the impact of climate change on this particular system, because any adverse impact on the ecosystem will affect biodiversity as well as the socioeconomic condition of this community who are living there. We know this mangrove protect the people from cyclone storm because that area prone to storm area. Uh, that is a different concept, but coming to the livelihood issues, I was really worried, but I got a very shocking uh, information that not only the climate change affecting the mangrove ecosystem all over the country, all, all over the world, but we are also the development program, that ongoing uh, development program, our yield planned development programs of the country also affecting our mangrove system because all mangroves are normally created in the mouth of the rivers. And the river brings the uh, nutrient and water from the landscape to the sea, the coastal area. That actually become the nutrient for the mangroves to thrive. Unfortunately, not even a single rivers in, in India, that are major rivers in, in India, untouched or undammed. Almost all the rivers are dammed uh, for various hydro projects, mean for uh, diversion of water or uh, generating electricity, whatever. Any kind of hydro projects on the river may give up with a release of water. We call them as a minimum environmental flow to sustain the life under the stream. But we can't do anything on the sediment inflow. The sediments are the nutrient that is you know, supplied by the landscape to the mangrove ecosystem and the other coastal habitat. Unfortunately, this is happening in the country. So all our estuarine habitat are now highly threatened because uh, uh, hydro projects on the river. We are not saying no to the hydro project. We should have a hydro project, but again, it should be in a sustainable manner without harming the estuarine habitat and mangrove habitat. The reason is what will happen to these 100,000 families? If these dam waters are not flowing into the estuarine, then the estuarine will become a marine. Then the people who are largely depend on the estuarine biodiversity uh, will lose those social livelihood actually. So your estuarine biodiversity will be changed or shifted into the marine biodiversity that may not be good for overall biodiversity conservation. So that is a big threat we are facing here. When coming back to the climate change, I could observe this coastal squeeze program. In fact, uh, the mangroves in the fringe of the towards the seaward side are actually destroyed by the sea level rise. And because of that, the composition of the mangrove community in that area getting changed. Uh, more salt tolerant mangroves are really sustaining in a bigger way than the less tolerant salt tolerant tree species. That also worrying us because when the coastal squeeze happen, whether the mangroves can migrate towards the land, but there is no land for them to migrate. That is another issue we are facing it. So the, what will happen to this biodiversity, which are exclusively depend on the mangrove ecosystem and the estuarine ecosystem, what will happen to those biodiversity? It's a big, big question. And then one more interesting information we come to know that the people will be losing the livelihood and the groundwater will be changing into uh, salt water. These are the problems uh, we actually come to know, even the phenology. Uh, because of the climate impact change, the phenolias of mangroves are changing it. And then there are a lot of uh, biodiversity, especially the insect biodiversity and a lot of arboreal animals who are depend on the phenological phenomenon of the mangroves. Their biology actually getting changed. 
So because of that changes, again, the overall biodiversity is uh, getting affected because of this uh, uh, climate change uh, impact. So what we need it when you are uh, trying to uh, do something for or prepare something for adaptive measure for conserve the climate uh, mangroves with respect to climate change, we shouldn't rule out the impact of the development on the mangrove ecosystem. So that is also simultaneously needs to be addressed. And uh, I hope this particular webinar, uh, I could see that yesterday discussion and today and tomorrow, these are the tasks uh, actually the uh, well-known experts are coming and uh, we are very thankful uh, to those excellent resource persons uh, who kindly agree to uh, provide input in this particular episode. I could see Kadiri uh, sir, one of our stalwart in the country uh, who actually promoted a mangroves uh, study in the country in a big way. And he is with us, he's still guiding us. That is a great test of kindness to you, sir. So I, without talking more and with this particular small uh, discussion, I welcome all our resource person uh, and also uh, all the participants who joined from different parts of the world. And uh, uh, we wish you a wonderful seminar on behalf of Wildlife Institute of India and the Center for International Forest Research. Thank you very much. Namaskar. Thanks a lot, uh, Professor Syokma, for providing a very good background for the for setting the stage for this uh, exciting day in the mangrove conference. Uh, thank, thanks a lot, sir. Uh, so uh, before uh, proceeding to the next session, I would like to uh, make a one uh, housekeeping announcement. So after the sessions, if uh, you if uh, any discussions or questions, kindly you can post them in the Q and A box uh, instead of uh, chat box because chat box is for different uh, reasons. And uh, please use the question and answer box for uh, discussions. So uh, our next uh, session is the uh, keynote address, the second keynote address of this uh, exciting webinar. So I like to uh, invite uh, uh, Sri Vasudevan sir for, uh, for uh, providing us his insight on, uh, on the particular topic. Uh, a brief introduction about uh, Sri uh, Vasudevan sir is, uh, he is a 1987 uh, batch IFS uh, Indian Forest Service officer, uh, belongs to the Maharashtra CADR, and uh, sir has a great background in uh, ma uh, marine biology. He had a master's in marine biology from Cochin University, and uh, he is well known for. Uh, he had a he so far had an illustrious career in the forest department, and uh, he is a pillar of. Uh, mangrove cell and which is one of one of the great success story in mangrove conservation in the country which can uh, in fact provide a good case study for other countries to follow how this provides a very good you know uh, example study for uh, how policy can influence conservation of mangroves and uh, sir has been the pillar for this mangrove cell he had headed the mangrove cell for eight years since its inception and then uh, foundation of mangrove foundation. So it was one of the greatest achievements uh, under his leadership. And uh, for his credit, he also a recipient, uh, recipient of uh, Arun Bo Bogirwar Award for Public Service Excellence in 2019, Maharashtra Civil Service Day Honor in 2017, a Mangrove Society of India Fellowship in 2016, and the Sanctuary Asia Wildlife Service Award in 2015 and MS Swaminathan Foundation Special Award in 1992. Uh, he has published two books and contributed several articles on mangroves and other coastal ecosystems. Um, thanks a lot, sir, for being with us. It's a, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you for joining. Uh, thank you, Nehru, uh, and uh, good morning which also means good afternoon, good evening to all of you. And it's a great pleasure to be in the company of mangrove lovers all from all over the world. <clears throat> I hope I'm audible. Yes, I sir, hope you're I'm audible. audible. Yeah, uh, thank you. So uh, uh, I'm here to talk about uh, the, uh, you call it success story, I call it my experience 
with mangrove conservation in Maharashtra, as stated by uh, Nehru, uh, it was for a long period, for a, usually for a, you know, a bureaucrat, a, a civil servant, the tenure is normally two to three years. But somehow, Maharashtra decided that we should have continuity and kept me there for uh, eight years, for which, for which reason I, know, uh, I could do a few things which now uh, people are calling, uh, calling it a success story. I'm really grateful for that. And I'm thankful to all the organizers of this event for inviting me. And uh, let's start uh, talking about what we did in Maharashtra. Let me share the small presentation. Is it, is it visible now? Is my screen visible? Uh, sir, your presentation, I think it's still loading. Uh, we could not see your presentation yet. Okay. Is it visible yes, now? Yes, yes, now it is. Yeah, okay. So let's start. Um, <clears throat> as introduced, you know, I am currently with the Forest Development Corporation. Uh, but uh, from 2012 uh, uh, to 2019, and I was there with the mangrove cell. And just a brief introduction about the mangroves in uh, the mangrove cover in uh, India. We have about 5,000 hectares of mangroves in uh, India. My major chunk of it, 42.45%, is in the West Bengal, part of Sundarbans. Uh, we have about 320 square kilometers, which is just 6% of the total mangrove cover. But when we started the work, it was only 4% and we were sixth. Now we are fifth in the ranking. And there are 20 species of uh, mangroves in Maharashtra. Uh, on, uh, on the Western coast, I think Maharashtra has the greatest uh, diversity in terms of uh, no, number of species. Uh, so this is the story we are talking about <clears throat> from uh, 2005 to 2013. The, the mangrove cover of uh, Maharashtra had remained uh, somewhat constant at 186 square kilometers. Uh, this is as per the report of Forest Survey of India. And they, pub they publish uh, reports every two years, starting from 1987, we have uh, records of forest cover, including mangrove cover. And uh, as I said, up to 2013, it was 186 square kilometer. And uh, somewhere around uh, 2012, we created the mangrove cell in Maharashtra as a dedicated unit for conservation of mangroves. And then uh, the increase started. So by 2015, we had raised to 222, then 2017, 304, and by 2019, 320 square kilometers, which is basically a 72% increase in the mangrove cover. These are all in square kilometers. Now, the 21 report is expected anytime, and let's hope that it will show further progress in uh, mangrove cover. So this is roughly the graph from 1987 to 2019. Uh, this is how we have progressed. So uh, when I talk about the mangrove story of Maharashtra, I think the first thing I should be talking about is a, an interim order of the Bombay High Court on mangrove conservation. Uh, we have a public interest litigation. Uh, that is, you know, anybody can file a, a public interest litigation uh, on a public cause, and the court can take cognizance of that and ask government uh, what they are doing. So in this case also, uh, uh, there was an organization called Conservation Action Trust, which filed uh, a, a, a public uh, interest litigation. And uh, on that basis, the Bombay High Court gave a very landmark order. So in that, they said they, there should be a total freeze on the destruction and cutting of mangroves in the state. The background is that there was a lot of concern that in a city like Mumbai, the mangrove cover is getting lost. And there are a lot of pressures from you know, 
several uh, powerful lobbies uh, to reclaim the land which is occupied by mangroves. And uh, as such, the, there is a lot of uh, population pressure on the natural resource in the city. And then it was compounded by the, the floods of uh, 2005, uh, in which you know, a lot of Mumbai sank and a lot of people lost their lives. And there was also the background of the tsunami, which happened uh, in 2004. And so with all this background, uh, uh, the Honorable High Court of Bombay took the you know, stand that we should conserve the mangroves. And they you know, prohibited all kinds of development on mangrove areas, also within 50 meters buffer from the mangrove areas. And uh, they also ordered that uh, no development permission is to be issued by any authority in respect of any area under mangroves, whether it is on government land or private land. And then one uh, very important uh, part of that judgment was that mangrove land should be converted as protected forest, which is a category of forest, and handed over to the forest department. Till this point, forest department did not have any role in managing mangroves. And we foresters are trained to manage terrestrial forests. So in that sense, uh, we practically had no connect with the, the mangroves. But following this judgment, uh, the, there was a mapping of uh, the, for the, the entire Mumbai and Abhi Mumbai area uh, based on satellite imagery. And then uh, around 5,469 hectares of mangroves were transferred to uh, forest department. And we first, you know, for the first time, we became you know, managers of mangroves, at least in Mumbai. And the orders also stated that we, in the rest of the Maharashtra coast, that is a western state, uh, state in India, the entire Maharashtra coast is about 720 kilometers. So entire coast, we have mangroves spread out. And uh, this, these mangroves are to be handed over to the forest department. So forest department did a lot of mapping and uh, you can see the map of Mumbai with that creek going in between, which is the Asia's largest creek called Tani Creek. So the map on the left is the, the map which shows you know, a different mangrove area. The red one is the, uh, the degraded mangrove, mangrove areas, sparse mangroves. And the uh, green one is the dense mangrove areas and rest are uh, you know, mud flats and uh, habitations and creeks, etc. Blue is the creek. So this is how the mapping was done and subsequently we did it for the entire Maharashtra coast. So I'll talk about some of these legal institutional policy initiatives which we took in Maharashtra, which can also be you know, a model for some of the other coastal states in India and perhaps even for other countries. So most important uh, development, uh, as I said, you know, 2005, this order came from uh, uh, High Court of uh, Bombay. And uh, by around uh, 2008, government had declared these areas as protected forests and handed over to the forest department. But then still there was a vacuum because uh, we were not trained you know, to manage forests. So it continued to be you know, somewhat neglected uh, in the overall scheme of forest department. So it was decided that there should be a dedicated cell for conservation of mangroves. That is how the mangrove cell of Maharashtra came into existence. Until today, Maharashtra is the only state with such a dedicated cell for mangrove conservation. It also looks, looks after uh, coastal and marine biodiversity issues. So uh, one very important uh, no, decision was to declare the uh, mangroves as protected forests. Then government of Maharashtra decided that protected forests are riddled with certain rights and encumbrances. And uh, there is a higher level, a higher degree of protection required for mangroves. So they decided to declare them as reserve forests. These are things, you, know, you can just understand that reserve forests are a higher degree of protection than protected forests. I will not get into the details of the distinction. Uh, maybe if somebody is interested, we can talk about in the question and answer session. Uh, so in uh, uh, in Mumbai, I had already said that no about uh, five thousand four hundred hectares, which includes uh, Mumbai and Navi Mumbai. But this uh, Mumbai alone, Navi Mumbai is on the eastern side of that Tane Creek. Mumbai proper is you know, where you have two districts, Mumbai and Mumbai suburban. So you have four thousand five hundred hectares of declared 
reserve forest. The number is growing now because there are agencies which are still holding on to some mangrove areas and they are slowly releasing it to the forest department. And rest of Maharashtra coast, we have declared about 12,500 hectares. So in all, 17,000 hectares of mangroves on government land is declared as Rusa forest, which is about 90% of the mangroves on government land. Maybe 10% is remaining. That is an ongoing process. And then we strengthened uh, uh, the mangrove protection framework, uh, particularly in Mumbai, where you have a a huge influx of population coming from different parts of the country, looking for employment, livelihood. And their first target is mangrove area where they can settle down because housing is a huge problem in Mumbai. Uh, so we created a special task force in Mumbai. It's called Mumbai Mangrove Conservation Unit. And we established forest stations at different strategic points. And we had a shortage of manpower from a forest department. So we uh, borrowed the service of Maharashtra Security Corporation which is basically a very interesting concept. Uh, people who uh, apply for uh, a job as a police constable, uh, they prepare a waiting list, those who are not selected, but they are given specialized training, almost similar to that of the you know, police personnel. And they are also given weapons and uh, even some uh, legal powers. So this corporation, uh, usually they look after industrial you know, uh, uh, establishments and all that. But we thought, you know, they would be a good uh, resource for protecting Mumbai's mangrove. So we, initially, I had uh, more than 150 personnel. The number has gone up of late. Maybe it is crossing 200 now. So, and there was Ill illegal encroachments all over Mumbai in, in mangrove areas. So we have removed 6,000 illegal hutments from various parts of Mumbai by using a lot of force sometimes, so taking the help of police and overcoming a lot of resistance from very powerful lobbies, including politicians. But uh, all said and done, in fairness, uh, I think uh, uh, I should state this, that you know, the government of Maharashtra gave very few, very strong support to us in removing these uh, encroachments. And they stood, stood solidly behind us, particularly our minister and our secretary uh, stood strongly behind us. So that, that's why we could overcome all kinds of political and uh, other pressures. And then we you know, uh, created mangrove nurseries. There are all, you know, all about 12 mangrove nurseries all over uh, you know, Maharashtra. Um, and uh, we could, you know, created nurseries, particularly a few species which are you know, for, you know, uh, found rare. They were particularly picked up from selected locations and raised in the nurseries so that their density would be more in the natural environment. And we did a lot of plantation. 8.3 million saplings were planted between 2013 to 2021, which covers 1,819 hectares and spread over 120 locations. Uh, this is a massive uh, mangrove plantation movement in which government fund was used. And then there was CSR funding support from uh, companies like Volkswagen, ICIC Bank, and all that. They also gave support. And then uh, <clears throat> there were also I know, I know. We were also you know, given support as part of the government program for you know, increasing the forestry cover in uh, Maharashtra. So this is a very successful uh, you know, uh, effort. And uh, then uh, we, we found that uh, mangrove cell is like a regulatory body. It's part of the forest department and uh, it can you know, regulate uh, activities in the mangrove. It was given statutory powers to do that. But we need a development body also. And there was an issue of you know, getting funds for this, uh, fund for mangrove development on a sustainable and continuous basis. So we created the Mangrove Foundation, uh, which is called the Mangrove and Marine Biodiversity Conservation Foundation, which addresses mangrove and marine biodiversity conservation, both. It's a registered society. It is started in December, 2015. Fortunately, at that time, uh, the, the new Mumbai airport uh, was uh, no, uh, getting come, you know, uh, you know, the work was uh, about to start and clearances were pending. And the government of India ordered that uh, uh, 115 crores, that is 1,150 million, uh, almost, a, almost 1 billion rupees, uh, should be given for mangrove conservation. So that's how we started. And then we built on the corpus from, from various projects which have indirect or direct impact on mangroves. And that is how the Mangrove Foundation has got a corpus fund of award, 
uh, 5 billion rupees uh, in dollar terms no one can convert uh, so this is uh, now available and from the interest of that corpus a lot of activities are being carried out by the uh, mango cell and the mango foundation all over maharashtra i'll talk about what activities we are doing and the advantage of this arrangement is that you, know, you need not depend entirely on the government funding you can mobilize resources from outside also the csr fund can also come in uh, fund from uh, uh, projects which have impact they can come in and uh, any any you know, private contributor can also come in uh, so this is the model that we have developed and it talk it looks after uh, this foundation looks after marine biodiversity conservation sustainable livelihood activities they promote research education and awareness we have small grants program for young researchers uh, so a lot of things and we also support mangrove conservation we have to pay the maharashtra security corporation for the uh, the personnel we hire so that is also paid from the mangrove foundation we created a mangrove uh you know we, we created uh, walls around mangrove areas in very sensitive areas highly where slums are threatening to get into the the mangrove areas uh, so all that was done and then it has got a, a, a structure of its own uh, with uh, uh, a lot of uh, people hired plus person, technical personnel hired from different sources and at the grassroots level also we made some institutional arrangements like mangrove co-management co committees at the panchayat level and self help groups of beneficiaries we hired project associates with fisheries background and forestry background to to communicate the idea of mangrove conservation with the local communities and also to train them in livelihood uh, activities so all this uh, you know are supported by livelihood specialists at district level and then there is a core team at the mangrove foundation to guide the overall activities and we did had to do a lot of capacity building because forest department was ill equipped uh, to handle mangrove management and associated activities so we trained our own staff we got lateral entry of specialists and we published a lot of field guides and in communication on uh, we you know one outreach we created you know, this uh, flagship sanctuary called tanakrit flamingo sanctuary, sanctuary a lot of tourists come and visit uh, the mangrove areas and they go by boat and watch the flamingo blows we created a Coastal Marine Biodiversity Center, a high-tech, uh, you know, state-of-the-art center, with the help of our uh, German partners in the GIZ project. Then, uh, in the urban areas, you know, the mangrove areas are littered with a lot of debris. Uh, we involve the local communities, you know, the the uh, uh, urban communities, the uh resident associations so the student bodies youth bodies and they voluntarily clean and we have cleaned 8000 tons of solid waste from mangroves in mumbai and there is one uh, place in the mentioned in the in a limca book of records and we introduced a number of uh, livelihood activities like crab farming mussel farming then uh, in in maharashtra there is a lot of oyster picking going on by the men Uh, the backbreaking activity. So we started this oyster farming uh, with the help of all these technical institutions and cage culture of fishes, so like floating cages, uh, used in a with species like sea bass. Ornamental fishery. We started a central breeding facility for clownfish, from which all these little clown clownfishes are given to village uh, level uh, self-help groups, and they would rear them for two months and then. uh and they would be they would be getting a better price and then village community led village eco tourism where women's groups will take uh, uh tourists by boat to mangrove areas explain about the different species and uh, also give them a good nice lunch and uh, talk about their traditions cultures and rituals so that's a wholesome experience that they give uh, to the tourists and in all this process you know we were supported by a number of institutions there are central institutes uh, basically icr institutes and uh, marine uh, fisheries and brackish water and fisheries technology and then there is a marine products export development authority and uh, so many other uh, selimeli center for ornithology wildlife institute bnhs uh, so, so many ngos also joined us but this model which i was talking about uh, which is uh, basically about Uh, creation of a big corpus fund this is the breakup of the different sources from where 
we accumulated this corpus of 526 crores. But we also got from funds from state budget. About 15 crores were given for livelihood activities. Apart from the interest on this corpus, we had funds from state budget uh, for uh, 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 for organ activities like livelihood activities. Then uh, some of these uh, no, CSR fund, district funds, urban bodies. Some we had two externally aided projects also, UNDP project and GIZ project. And then now the Green Climate Fund is also supporting us. So this is the growth in the uh, Corpus Fund of Mangrove Foundation. Starting from 115 crores, it has reached 526 crores in uh, just about <clears throat> five, six years. So now the way forward will be to you know through the Green Climate Fund project, uh, which is spread over three states, including Maharashtra, Andhra Pradesh, and Odisha. We are trying to scale up some of these activities, including marine biodiversity conservation, with a focus on climate change. And uh, we want to expand the you know, livelihood activities uh, uh, to a level where it will benefit about 10,000 families across Maharashtra, Maharashtra coast. And then we are planning a multi-species hatchery for crabs, sea bass, and bivalves, where many institutes will come together, give their technology, and will work under one roof. And that will be give a big boost to the the uh, culture based livelihood activities for people living close to the mangrove areas. And then uh, for the urban population to appreciate the the aesthetic value and uh, the to have a sense of you know, oneness with nature. We are creating uh, two major parks in uh, Mumbai. There's already a center at Iroli, which I have uh, spoke, spoken about, but then two major centers for recreation. Uh, they are coming up in uh, Mumbai. The Gorewada Park is already you know, under construction, and the Dahisar will also soon start. So with these two parks, they will really showcase uh, the mangrove. Area. The idea is that generally people of uh, Mumbai look at mangroves as some kind of wasteland where uh, you know, mosquitoes breed, antisocial elements proliferate. There's nothing much a normal citizen can get from uh, the mangrove areas. And he's really not bothered about the livelihood activity because he has other livelihood, he or she. So this is to showcase the value of mangroves. Uh, they can take uh, now their children, their families uh, to the mangrove areas, understand nature, so a little bit, bit of education, bit of entertainment. That is how we look at uh, mangrove conservation. But now with this model, uh, the entire uh, the mangrove conservation, with the mangrove foundation with its robust financial support that it can give or uh, over a sustainable you know, uh, for a long period of time. Uh, now it is in safe hands. And this model government of India has also you know, actually indicated that uh, in the, uh, the wildlife, National Wildlife Action Plan, They've indicated that all coastal states should follow this model by creating um, coastal ecosystem cell and uh, by giving dedicated attention to the mangroves and marine biodiversity. And they can also you know, get uh, you know, uh, funding like this, like we got in Mangrove Foundation, wherever projects have impact on uh, coastal or marine biodiversity, that fund can be dedicated, a, per a certain percentage of that project cost can be dedicated for this uh, mangrove fund uh, conservation. And that will really sustain uh, uh, the mangrove conservation and marine biodiversity conservation efforts without really you know, uh, depending on the vagaries of uh, uh, government support, uh, which may vary from year to year. So this in brief is our uh, Maharashtra model. Uh, and if there are any questions, I'd be glad to answer. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, sir, for uh, sharing with us uh, your wonderful model for how public, private, and government institutions come together can achieve in mangrove conservation. Uh, it was great to hear the story, uh, great to hear the uh, actions taken by the Ma uh, Maharashtra Forest Department towards conservation of mangroves. And this has, in fact, paved way for you know, uh, replica, it's, it's in a way a replicable model and it is, I hope uh, other other states could also take it up and replicate it. And uh, as I see from the question and answers uh, box, uh, there is, there are not much questions. Uh, there is one question. Uh, what is the survival rate of restoration from nurseries to replantation? Sir, is there any uh, uh, insights on that? 
Yeah, survival is really good. Uh, we have to make sure that uh, the uh, the plantation sites are selected properly, and uh, we have to ensure that there, there is regular flushing of tidal water. And our nurseries, uh, now we grow them uh, well, and uh, the planting stock is uh, maintained well. So uh, the success rate is very high. I would say not less than eighty percent. And uh, we have not had any experience of major failures. Maybe one or two sites there were problems with tidal flushing even after we created canals. Uh, then you have to do desilting from time to time to ensure that tidal flow. But sometimes there is, you know, the selection of species. Although you do proper planning at the ground level, sometimes there's a little bit of bungling, and uh, it may lead to some mortality. But generally, I think uh, the mangroves are really very resilient, and if you give a bit of helping hand, they will definitely. You know, Bounce back. Okay. Uh, for, because of the crunch of time, uh, I would only take one more question. Uh, so there is a question. Uh, the livelihood program are great. How are the market linkages are established for the cooperatives? Yeah, they are not cooperatives. They are basically self-help groups. And they are, these self-help groups are connected to the, the village level mangrove conservation units uh, or uh, um, so they, they are linked to the panchayat, but generally we help them in getting the market. For example, you take uh, uh, Sivas culture. There's a huge demand for Sivas. And whatever we produce is snapped up by the market. So there is no problem at all. And they give, get good price. Mm -hmm. um, only we have a problem with you know, oysters because you know, they don't fetch too much price. And then unless you, know, you do that, uh, I mean, they are really export quality, but then you have to do that uh, uh, process of removing the you know, you know, pollutants and elements, uh, chemical elements in that. That that kind of facility is not established. But as far as crabs and sea bass are concerned, there is absolutely no problem. And uh, ornamental fishery, uh, now it is picking up very well. And a lot of people are coming to buy these uh, ornamental fishes from us. Uh, the tourism is flourishing. We have also introduced some kayaking in some areas. Uh, so that's also getting good, good publicity. Mangrove Foundation actually you know, gets involved with the uh, marketing of the produce in a big way. And they connect to the local communities with the, with the buyers. But there is a lot more that one can do in due course of time to enhance the marketing potential of this livelihood activity. As the volume increases as, in the, as more and more villages you know, come into play, I think uh, larger players will also come and uh, you know, join us in uh, uh, giving a good marketing support to these livelihood uh, products. Okay. Thank, thank you. Uh, thank, thanks a lot, sir. So there are a uh, few more questions in the uh, question and answer session. And if time permits, I, I kindly request you to uh, answer them in the question and session, sir. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I'll be glad. Thank you thank so much. You. So uh, thank, thank you for joining us. So with that, uh, we move on to the next session. Uh, uh, before I introduce uh, the speaker of the next session, uh, maybe uh, this is one of the Blue Moon uh, events. So that means it's uh, it will be great to have a picture clicked with all the panelists around. So I request Vito to uh, take a moment to uh, click a uh, group picture. So I kindly request all the resource persons to turn on your cameras and just uh, flash a mangrove smile for a moment. So Vito, you're ready? Yes, so open your, everybody open the cameras, time to stretch your face a little bit and say mangrove cheese. Is there mangrove. any product such as yeah. cheese mangrove? No, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, okay, so everybody on the cam. Yes. Yes, Dr. R. Rama, Rama Subramian, are you there? Probably you can open your camera. If not, let's not take. Let's... Yeah, let's take the first. Okay, 
Smile, give the widest smile you have. One, two, and uh, okay, one more time. Don't go anywhere. Keep the smile on. So, one, two, three. Okay, that's right. Thank you. Back Thanks to you, Dr. Nehru. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Vito. So, uh, with that, we move on to the next session. Uh, we have with us uh, uh, Dr. Professor Baduri. Uh, Professor Baduri, could you hear us? You're yes, there? I can, I can hear yes, you. Yeah. Yes, Thank wonderful. you so much. So, thanks a lot for joining us. Uh, so, so, yeah, before uh, handing the floor over to Dr. Professor uh, Baduri, I like to uh, give a brief introduction about him. So uh, he had completed his master's from uh, Edinburgh and PhD from Polymouth in the United Kingdom. And um, he's one of the uh, key researchers among um, mangrove researchers in India. He works uh, mostly um, largely on microorganisms and uh, he has very interesting publications on his uh, a career and uh, so many of them are very very recent publications, especially on biogeography uh, aspects. And um, he's a uh, he had contributed to many uh, uh, editorial boards, and uh, he he was the team leader of India's Arctic expeditions to 2010, and also was one of the key panelists on climate resilience and coastal adaptation in the recently concluded COP26 at Glasgow and uh, his uh, a detailed brief bio is there in the website. I uh, encourage everyone to have a look at it. So because of the crunch of time, uh, I stop here and handing the floor over to Dr. Baduri. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Prabhakaran. Uh, just give me a second. I hope you can see my... Uh, Full screen. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Prabhakaran. Thank you, Dr. Bhumia. Um, I think you've given me a very, very tight and a complex topic to cover. And uh, just like most of the speakers are facing. So um, I need to, I'll talk about the importance of benthic uh, uh, fauna in, in mangrove ecosystems. But rather than giving a broad overview, I'll focus on one or two groups and give you examples, trying to help you understand uh, that we really do not know much about uh, how benthic fauna actually regulates most of the ecosystem processes, rather than some generalization that we have. And that reflects the lack of knowledge and the need to undertake such kind of experiments in, in mangrove ecosystems, particularly in the Indian subcontinent. Uh, to us, we already know that coastal oceans are very, very important. Our human, uh, our health, livelihood, well-being, uh, everything is linked to the coastal oceans. 5,000 years of the history of the civilization that we have, uh, you know, that is intricately shaped by the coastal ocean. So, so the importance of coastal ocean need not be uh, you know, re-emphasized, uh, but we need to understand how important this is. And... Uh, at the land ocean boundary systems, many of the biotopes that are there, which we call it as marginal marine environments, among which mangroves are there, they are very critical to maintaining our health system. Now, uh, when we talk about ecosystem processes, there are many of these processes that goes on. Here is one representation from the warden's paper of science uh, that came out a couple of years ago. Essentially, it's a microbial loop. loop but here I wanted to highlight the importance to understand the benthic pelagic coupling, how the benthic fluxes are controlling the tropic level systems. And between in the benthic uh, flux, when, when you're trying to understand the benthic flux, how the communities are interacting with each other. And uh, frankly speaking, in mangrove systems, uh, we do not know much about it. Some work has been done, but uh, our knowledge is largely limited. And therefore, we need to understand uh, these processes in a much deeper way. I will give two examples uh, in, in this talk today. First, I'll talk about this group, the benthic foraminifera. We do not call them as benthic fauna because they're protist, uh, but they're very, very important and relatively little studied in mangroves. And the second one is, uh, is a typical metazoan group, the free living marine nematodes. And I'll, 
I'll try to highlight how we, how by knowing these communities, we can start to decode the, uh, understand the microbial loop, the interaction between the benthic and the pelagic layers. Now, this uh, brings in the concept of biocomplexity because uh, coastal ocean is very, very complex and the biological communities that are there in this kind of systems are extremely complex. Uh, the reason being is that there is an intricate functional relationship between this uh, complexity that has been shaped over thousands of years uh, and that ultimately has been translated into ecosystem processes. What we know that uh, many of the biological com uh, complexity that we see, including in case of benthic organisms, these are some way or other related to the physical and chemical complexity of coastal ocean. And uh, when you're talking about the Indian subcontinent, this is far more interesting because uh, most of the mangroves that we have, for example, in the east coast of India, they are strongly influenced by the freshwater. Uh, and therefore, uh, we have very typical functional guilds that are there and how these are being driven needs to be understood. And when you want to understand such kind of processes, uh, organismal function or organismal structure interaction, we need to have regular and long-term observation, essentially snapshots uh, of observations. And this is what is the basis of time series. A time series provides a very deeper understanding of really what the organism is doing in the ecosystem, how organisms are interacting between each other, and ultimately how the ecosystem responses are on a, on a larger scale, which is ultimately linked to the socioeconomics, as we have been uh, hearing in the last uh, lecture. Now, when we talk about uh, coastal ocean and we need to focus on the marginal marine environments, essentially these are uh, very young structures. These have been formed uh, since the end of last post-glacial rise of sea level, so around 12,000 years or so. And mangroves is one of the features of that. Uh, one of the uh, other thing that we see is that many of these young structures, uh, they not only are a major sink of TOC, as we heard about uh, in yesterday's lecture of Gurmit, uh, but also they are facing rapid changes because of anthropogenic climate change and, and, and the changes that is brought in in terms of the relative sea level. So, so you have got the effect of the Anthropocene that also needs to be understood in, in terms of the functional guilds of uh, benthic communities. I work in the Sundarbans, our team works in Sundarbans and here is the Indian part of the Sundarbans I'm, I'm showing to you. Uh, it's, it's the world's largest contiguous mangrove ecosystem spread across India and Bangladesh. But what is very interesting about Sundarbans is that uh, if you look at the freshwater flow of Sundarbans, it can vary between 40,000 cubic meter per second to about 120,000 cubic meter per second. You know, that happens during the monsoon time. Um, and it has got very high suspended particulate matter load between 200 to 700 milligram per liter. So obviously, uh, there are extremes out there. You know, you've got huge freshwater flow in which the mangroves have evolved. You have got organisms which are living in the benthic layers that withstand this fluctuation of freshwater uh, and the mixing of the saline water. And then you have got the surface water where there is hardly light is penetrating through, through therefore the phytodetritus that are settling down, that also you know, kind of varies seasonally. And that uh, brings in a lot of stressors uh, to the benthic community. So, so we need to then understand some of this component in a, in a deeper way. And of course, in this water, there are millions and millions of bacteria cells. So what we have done is more than almost 12 years now, uh, we set up a time series site. This we have named it as Sundarbans Biological Observatory Time Series. This is probably the only time series site based in mangroves in South Asia, if I'm not wrong. And what we have done is we have set up this time series site in the westernmost part of the Indian Sundarbans. This is this big island is there called Sagar Island. And we have got three uh, stations that we monitor. You know, we look at all the things, benthic organisms, bio, you know, uh, biological and chemical fluxes, rates, processes, everything that we can think of so that we can disentangle many of the unknown processes. For example, regional carbon fluxes, regional nitrogen cycle. You know, um, what is the carrying capacity of this ecosystem in terms of fisheries? Those are the kind of questions that we are uh, interested about. And Typically, a time series site gives you this kind of robust data. Here, what I've done is I've plotted our time series data of salinity, for example, uh, in the westernmost part of Sundarbans. And you can see that this oscillation is there. But what is very interesting is 
that the saline condition is actually changing. It is becoming more saline. So there is less freshwater flow is happening. So, so that would also bring in a lot of changes in terms of structure and function of uh, biological communities, including benthic communities. One interesting aspect to look at it is when you, when you look at benthic communities, we cannot remove the uh, microbial communities in terms of the bacterial communities because they are very, very important. They are the ones which are making the organic matter available in some form or other to the benthic communities, particularly the labile forms. So here, what we have done is we have tried to figure out why the Sundarban mangrove is very, very unique. And here we have done deep sequencing and you know, next generation sequencing. And we see that in Sundarbans, there are unique populations of Farmicutes are there, and, and it's a biblio dominated system, which is very different from rest of the other uh, ecosystems or, or many of the other mangroves, for example, in, in China uh, uh, to, to begin with. So, say the Jiang estuary or the Jiolong estuary or the Paul estuary, the Hangzhou estuary mangroves, and of course, the other coastal systems. So, so, so therefore, uh, the interaction between the microbes and the benthic layers are, are very, very important. And, and therefore, this is uh, interesting. The second thing I wanted to highlight is that uh, in this system, such as in Sundarbans, we have got a lot of nitrogen in the system. Okay, Most of this nitrogen is coming in the westernmost part because of the anthropogenic nitrogen input. So, so we can now differentiate parts of the Sundarbans into low nitrogen areas and high nitrogen areas. And obviously, the forms of nitrogen, uh, for example, ammonia versus nitrate, that would have huge implications in terms of phytoreparital pool and resulting influences in, in terms of benthic communities and ultimately ecosystem processes. Uh, so I'll give you the first example. Uh, these are foraminifera. You know, these are very, very primitive organisms. You know, uh, the, uh, they've evolved during the Precambrian times uh, and, and have, have continued to diversify in our planet. Uh, mostly there are two forms are there based on the chemical structures. You've got the agglutinated form and the calcareous form. So this is something which is very, very important because they're made up of uh, the carbonate system. And when you're talking about a changing ocean, uh, changing carbonate chemistry, ocean acidification scenario, this is a group something which you should look at. So here, what, I have, uh, what I'm trying to show you, for example, in Sundarbans, when you look at what is the uh, community pattern is well one thing is very clear is you don't have high species diversity of benthic foraminifera okay number one number two you see that the system is dominated by stress tolerant taxa so ammonia is a fantastic example of that it doesn't matter whenever you sample you know you see that there is dominance of ammonia in the system but also you get a lot of signals which are very very unique for a mangrove system so for example jadamina macrocells so this is a foraminifera you will find in mangrove, in only in mangroves. So where there is mangrove vegetation is there. So imagine a scenario where the vegetation is degrading or breaking up. Then you will be able to use Jadamina as an ecological tool, or to understand the health of the of the breakdown uh, or, or the kind of degradation of the mangroves. And there are oscillations of other groups that happens in this system. So so there is a seasonal pattern that we see. Uh, in the uh, in the benthic foraminifera, and when you look at it from a viewpoint of calcareous and agglutinated form, the system is dominated by calcareous form. So, uh, uh, the reason being is that the calcareous form, the their test or the the shell that we call it as, they are very very robust. So, in Sundarban system, you know you've got a lot of uh, wave action is there. Um, okay, so thus. The calcareous forms have a much bigger ch chance of of uh, kind of uh, you know uh, surviving. Uh, agglutinated form we find more upstream of the Sundarbans. If you go more north, where the freshwater flow is more more important. So, so there is a nutrient stoichiometry that is playing a very very important role, which is determining or uh, controlling the distribution of the agglutinated versus the calcareous uh, foraminifera. But when you try to understand the ecosystem from the viewpoint of uh, foraminifera, I think one is very important to understand is. Uh, life to death ratio, you know, life foraminifera test. Here you can see on the bottom right hand side, the more than 70% of the test is has actually taken, taken up a stain called the Rose Bengal stain. So this is an indicator of ecological health, the live test. And here what you have done is you have tried to plot the live and the dead test based on, uh, on a salinity gradient. So from top to bottom, as you go down, uh, the salinity becomes, uh, you know, increased in, in Sundarbans. There are, these are the two major estuaries, for example, the Matla and the Takula. 
And here you see that actually live test are not much is there. Wherever there is live test is there, the mangrove vegetation is very, very diverse. So, so actually you can start to disentangle or use the live to date ratio of foraminifera as a way to understand the uh, health of the, of the Sundarban system. And you can do it in any mangrove as a matter of fact. It's not like just Sundarbans, but it's very important to, in this system because here the freshwater flow is a very important factor. Now, what here I have done is I've tried to give you some understanding of really how the patterns actually changes. If I take the Sundarbans mangrove, if I take the mangroves of the Gautami Godavari estuary, and let, let, let me take a lagoonal system such as Chilka, you know, and we did these studies a couple of years back. We looked at 11,378 specimens, and these encompassed about 32 species and 13 families. And you look at, at the species richness, Shannon diversity, and Fisher's alpha, you'll see that actually the mangroves of the Gautami Godavari estuary, they are much rich in terms of species, okay, uh, for aminifera species. But if you look at the Chilika or if you look at the uh, Sundarban, the species richness is not that much. But if you look at it in terms of um, Shannon diversity and, and species alpha, of course, uh, the, the Gautami Godavari estuary shows a, shows a very different uh, pattern. So, so that tells you that even along a geographical gradient, starting from Sundarbans to the estuaries of the Gautami, Gautami uh, Godavari, the mangroves, uh, there is a, a trend that appears uh, uh, in the system. And that may be because of the fluxes that is changing in, in the ecosystem. Now, if we take this data and try to plot it with other global studies, so for example, other mangroves that we know globally in terms of the species diversity and of course uh, in lagoons, we see that uh, Sundarbans is actually somewhere intermediate, okay, uh, or, or the Gautami Godavari is more on the higher side. So it tells you that that, that brackish water and the normal marine scenario, you know, how that actually plays a very, very important role in controlling the structure and, and function of the of the benthic foraminifera communities. Now, during the course of study, we found very interesting things. You know, we found uh, cryptic biodiversity examples. You know, here we found three uh, new putative species uh, of of uh, foraminifera. We have named it as ammonia T two, T six, and T ten, and they are very different from what we have seen in published literature or from the taxonomic keys. They have a distribution that ranges from Sundarbans to Chilika Lagoon, so mostly in the northeast coastal bay of Bengal. Uh, so, so the question is, their number is also quite high. So, obviously, these species have actually adapted to to this ecosystem, um, you know, and they are playing a very important role in terms of uh, turnover of carbon or or nitrogen or other important elements, and they are maybe playing a very important role in the over eco overall ecosystem processes. So. So we can start to now decode the individual importance of these cryptic species in, in ecosystems such as Sundarbans or, or in Chilka uh, to begin with. Now, from here, I go to the second example. Uh, I hear the idea is I'll talk about the free living marine nematodes uh, because they are numerically very, very abundant. Uh, wherever you go, the niche, uh, our species estimation is very poor. I think we think, we think there are about 10,000 species that we know, but actually the number of species could be several folds higher. So the idea here in this case is we look at the marine nematodes in the benthic sediment from the, not only just from microscopy, but from the viewpoint of molecule level, so that ultimately we can link it with functions and flux measurements. Uh, so uh, organisms, community structure, flux uh, measurements. And uh, this is a very challenging group to work with because uh, uh, from the Indian mangrove system or in the Indian subcontinent, there's only a few hundred species have been discovered and there is so much cryptic biodiversity is there, you know? Um, and the available keys that are there, these are mostly from the European or North American waters. So it doesn't really help us. Uh, in Sundarbans, we have recorded 179 species of the free living marine nematodes. And we can differentiate them based on the functional gills, for example, whether they're bacteriovores, whether they're detrital feeders, et cetera. But I think we, our understanding is still very poor because we see huge cryptic biodiversity of, uh, of, of uh, this group. 
Now, I what I'll do is I'll give you example from the west coast of India. So these are the two mangroves that we are studying. Kerala and Agarwadi, uh, actually part of the Sindhudurg system. Here, what we have done is instead of doing the traditional or the, or the morphology based identification, you have taken the help of molecular tools. So we have uh, collected sediment cores, and from the sediment core, we have top three centimeter of the sediment core, we have extracted the environmental DNA, and we made library and we have done sequencing. And from there, we started to deduce the ecological function. So here you can see that there are different groups of uh, free living marine nematodes are there. But what is very important is what kind of information can we draw? Well, the first information we draw is that there is dominance of groups in oxic layer. So as the upper layer is becoming more and more oxic, there is dominance of this group. In the oxic and oxic boundary, there are only specialized groups are there. Uh, there are organisms are there which actually plays a very important role in breakdown of organic uh, matter. There is dominance of proteobacteria in the system. Uh, so, so that's something which is interacting with the, with the free living marine nematode communities. It seems there are some nematode bacteria association is going on and there is evidence of sulfur reduction. And what is very interesting is we find this genus called Sabatiera. It's a, it's a free living marine nematode genera, genus which is tolerant to low oxygen concentration. You know that the mangrove sediment actually faces prolonged suboxic conditions. So this organism can, can be present at, uh, along the vertical uh, core of the sediment or the vertical layer of the sediment. So, so they are very, very important. And if I go to the east coast of India, that is also the case. Now, when we looked at it uh, more thoroughly, we found that there are you know, several hundreds of these novel sequences. You know, These are very, very widespread. Um, it looks to us these are very uh, these could be cryptic species complexes. As a matter of fact, we are working now with three new species which are describing uh, in different stages from the system. And one thing has become very clear is that the global databases of of very nematodes are not adequate to actually assign the the nematodes that we see in mangrove ecosystem, mangrove sediment. So. So if we want to deduce bigger picture of ecological structure, function, or flux measurements, we really first have to get our baseline information much more robust. Uh, the other part I wanted to highlight very quickly is that we really do not know how tannin breakdown actually happens. Mangrove litter, you know, millions and tons of it actually are being shedded every year. And uh, we really don't understand what is the effect of the litter fall on, on the benthic uh, sediment. And, here in this case, we are doing some experiments, mesocosm experiments, where we have bought hundred liters of several hundred liters of water from the Sundarbans, and we put, a, put up a sedimentary layer, trying to understand the mimic the benthic pelagic coupling processes, and we have put tannin enriched uh, enriched them with tannin, and then run this experiment for a long duration, and we of course see that a shift of the of the bacterial communities. Uh, from proteobacteria dominated system to functional important systems such as bacteroidetes and firmicutes. So remember, we talked about firmicutes in the beginning. And these communities will have a huge impact on the sedimentary layer on the sedimentary uh, benthic organisms. And here is one nice example where you can see our delta 13C measurement, stabilized of measurement clearly reflects how the, how in, in terms of control to tannin rich system, actually the delta 13C signature is changing and the responses of phytoplankton, zooplankton keeps changing. So obviously that would have a cascading effect on the sedimentary uh, benthic community. So, so we are still doing these experiments, trying to understand really what is going on at, at the benthic organismal level. Uh, so, so hopefully in some other opportunity, I'll be able to share that data with you all. Now I come to the much bigger picture, application side. You know? uh, we have been talking about nature-based solutions yesterday. And here I am showing in Sundarbans the top one photo is what has happened after Amphan. Actually, the system started to regenerate. Of course, uh, ecosystem is very resilient. Mangrove ecosystem are resilient. But then uh, again, this year there's another cyclone. Yas was there, inundation was there. So, and in the Bay of Bengal, we are going to see more and more of this, uh, you know, becoming frequent. And uh, 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 Jawad being the latest example. Now. Mangrove plantation has to be more scientific approach uh, and has to be taken. And here, what we are doing is we have proposed a concept called geobiometrics concept. The idea is to bring in stability to the mangrove uh, sapling. We are using the benthic fauna to actually augment nutrition, bringing in matrix stability so that in a small time, 
the sediment, the mangrove saplings can grow much faster, and that ultimately play a very, very important role in, in, in sedimentary stability. This is important for Sundarbans, where there is very high erosion of, of sediment. It's a natural process that is going on, and of course, sea level rise has, has been accelerating that. So this is a typical local solution uh, of, uh, to an NBS approach. I almost come to the end. Uh, we use the benthic fauna for sea level rise measurements. So you can look at our paper. And last but not the least, automation is very important. If you want to understand process, uh, such as benthic process, you have to do automation. In Sundarbans, we are doing, it, doing that. Uh, 24 by 7 data is coming from the benthic pelagic layer so that we can ultimately build up this kind of model that we have done for Kakinara Bay, uh, you know, where we see that the macro benthos is a very, very important component that is controlling the sedimentary uh, processes. So uh, why do we all of this? We are doing all of this to ultimately understand or contribute to the SDG goals, uh, you know, uh, particularly life below water. And I think zero hunger is, according to me, is very important. And of course, 13. And why all of these are important? Because it is important because we, the humans, benefit more from marine resources if ocean management is successfully integrated. And this is what we have written in the second World Ocean Assessment of the United Nations. And uh, we have a lot to know from this system. Thank you very much for your time and, and listening. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh... Professor Baduri for, for the ex uh, exciting talk. In, in fact, uh, the previous speakers in the last day have uh, emphasized on least studied organisms in mangroves and you have, you know, exactly you have focused on that. It was very uh, exciting to hear. And uh, as I see from the Q&A box, there is no questions as such, but as uh, uh, if, if there are questions, uh, Maybe you can just post the question in the Q&A box that uh, Professor Badri will answer it later in the day. Is that fine, Professor Badri? Yeah, absolutely fine with you. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, and we have one request. Uh, uh, Vasudevan sir want to go live for a uh, answer. Uh, so do you want to take over to answer it? Is it any mangrove species grow in fresh water? No, I, the, generally the mangroves grow in brackish water. Uh, they prefer a salinity range between uh, 15 to 20 pt. Sometimes they can tolerate higher salinity. There are some species which prefer low salinity. Of course, you know, we found that you know, there are species like the Ritiera littorals, Dolicantron spatesiae, and uh, Sonaracea cassiolaria, they prefer low salinity. Absolutely fresh water, some species may grow uh, because now uh, basically you know, their mechanism is designed to exclude uh, salt. It's not that they love uh, salt, they you know, uh, they have a mechanism to tolerate salt. But at the same time, in a purely freshwater en environment, they get edged out by the more you know, aggressive, competent, you know, more suitable species. The mangroves don't generally thrive in the freshwater areas. Okay. But then if you go to Kutch, you know, in that area, far away from the sea, you will find an odd mangrove. Uh, but I have not really found, you know, mangroves, you know, other than this salt environment, you know, thriving far away from the coast. There are many mangrove associates which you can always find in, and some classify them as mangroves. For example, Cerbera odola. <clears throat> It's a plant, it's basically some people may say it's a mangrove. Most people say it is a mangrove associate. Uh, they can be found in the, they're equally comfortable in the mangrove environment. They are found elsewhere also. Like there are a few other species which are in, in, in the border, borderline. Even Dolly Cantons, Patricia, some people say it is a mangrove as, uh, associate. So, uh, general observation is that you know, we don't have to worry about whether mangroves are thriving in the uh, uh, no, freshwater environment. We should be happy that there are a group of plants which can thrive even in the saline environment and they are still there on the face of the earth. And we should try our best to protect them. And that is a niche where no other plants can occupy. So that is the importance of that. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.
So uh, there are questions coming up for Dr. Ba Professor Badri also. Uh, because of uh, time crunch, I request you to you know take it in the Q and A session and answer it there itself. Thank you. Uh, so we will. Uh, for now, we can break for a few minutes and then we will uh, back in uh, five minutes time to have uh, other sessions uh, lined up. So, so we will be back around 10.55. Thank you. Okay, uh, welcome back yes. everyone. Welcome back everyone for the next session. So uh, like previous session, so for this session, we have a, a one more talk and then followed by a panel discussion. So the, the next talk will be uh, uh, delivered by Dina from uh, University, University of Georgia. Uh, because of the time difference, uh, Dina could not join us. Uh, so it's, uh, it's already a midnight in, uh, in Georgia. So that means, so we're going to have a, a video presentation made by Dina and um, a short introduction about Dina. She's a doctoral candidate at uh, Department of Geography and Integrative uh, Department of Geography and uh, Integrative Conservation Program at the University of Georgia. Uh, she works largely on the uh, mangrove and socio ecological systems in uh, Bidar Karnega. And she, uh, recently, there are some interesting papers she had came up with. So uh, kindly, uh, you can check the bio of her in the website. Uh, so I request uh, Vito to uh, play the video presentation right away. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Dina Raskina, a doctoral candidate in the Department of Geography and the Integrated Conservation Program at the University of Georgia. Uh, so for my doctoral research, I study the reciprocal relationships between uh, human mangrove ecosystems in India, specifically in Bithar Kanika uh, Wildlife Sanctuary, and today I will be presenting uh, some of my research that looks at how small scale pressures like um, firewood extraction can impact mangrove carbon services and how that relates to sociocultural values of people living near these forests. Uh, so just to give you an overview, um, this is a brief outline of what I would what I intend to share with you today. Um, I will begin by giving some background on the different mangrove management or protection regimes in the country, and then uh, dive into how that might or how that influences social social cultural values of people living near these areas. Also, what that really means um, for the long term sustainability of mangrove vegetation by presenting some results uh, from my research. And as we all know, mangroves provide a wealth of services that support and maintain human com communities around the world. Now, these include protection from storm surges and floods, nurseries and breeding habitats for a variety of terrestrial, estuarine and marine fauna, and livelihood needs of local communities. And they are also equally important from a climate mitigation point of view because of their carbon sequestration services. Mangroves can sequester a large amount of carbon, even more than their more than terrestrial uh, rainforests, and much of this carbon is stored in the form of in in soil uh, beneath the mangrove trees. So, although carbon mitigation services seem very important in the current times, and rightly so, um, the irony is that people who live very close to these forests may not may or may not see them in terms of carbon. And they associate these forests with a number of ecosystem services, such as uh, a place where fish is plenty, order is plenty, uh, the water is clean, uh, their houses are safe, and they have wood, um, which is also for some form of carbon, but uh, wood to build their houses, boats to fish, and uh, also wood to cook their food. So where are these forests located in India, and how does that influence mango human values? Uh, let's look at how um, protection areas are, for, are defined in India first uh, before diving into uh, where these forests are found in the country. So in India, uh, protected areas such as national parks, wildlife sanctuaries, etc., they're as shown on the map here um, in the form of these yellow polygons, a special zone set aside for biodiversity conservation. 
Now, apart from providing a habitat for threatened and endangered species, it is also important to note that these areas are not entirely isolated, but are embedded in highly human-dominated landscapes. Therefore, frictional relationships between officials and local people because of illegal extraction or human-wildlife conflict is often observed in such areas. So it's also important to note that rights and privileges of local people differ in each protected area. For example, in a national park, human interference uh, from timber harvesting, fuel wood collection, or you know, collection of minor forest products, as well as private ownership rights is prohibited. Whereas uh, these restrictions are waived off in sanctuaries as long as they do not interfere with the well being of wildlife. We also see a very similar situation with uh, most of the mangrove forests in the country. Uh, so, India possesses about 3% of the world's mangrove forests, which are shaped by different pulse, press and pulse disturbances. Um, such as sea level rise, coastal development arising from you know, infrastructure projects like roads or tourism uh, projects, uh, as well as frequent tropical cyclones that impact these coasts and impact our coast annually. So in the country, these forests are distributed all along the west and the east coast and its islands. And much of the remaining large expanses of mangrove forests are found within, uh, you know, um, in tropical, in pro sorry, in protected zones uh, within the country. Uh, some of them are listed here. So it kind of becomes imperative to understand how these multiple zones of protection kind of accommodate, you know, these multiple zones of interaction. And what does that really mean for conservation management and planning? So this kind of brings us to the dilemma of trade-offs. Uh, while some things are gained, others may be lost. So while you know, advocating for you know, different conservation interventions, the full range of possible trade-offs between human livelihoods and conservation may not be explicitly acknowledged or even discussed as interventions are sought, such as access to these forests is, is in itself a trade-off to many. Therefore, recognizing these trade-offs is important when we think of conserving these forests. So keeping this in mind, I ask how um, social cultural values align with different mangrove ecosystem services, especially in protected areas, and how does that differ across genders and uh, diverse stakeholders? So I kind of used Bitharkanika Wildlife Sanctuary, which is located on the east coast of the country in the state of Odisha as a case study. And um, partly because this area has a diverse land tenure system, it was under the Zamindari uh, system, uh, which is an aristocratic way of collecting land revenue in the form of land taxes until about 1951. It was then declared a wildlife sanctuary in 1975 and then a national park in 1998. Um, with that's the core zone of the park which is you know this area so but only in 2002 it was also recognized as a ramsar wetland site because you know the high diversity of mangrove flora found in this region as well as uh you know a number of endangered species um of um you know fauna found here and these include uh crocodile species it also accommodates the largest nesting area of the olive ridley, ridley turtle and uh, numerous bird assemblages. Now, although this area seems a little isolated from many of the largest cities of the state, it is heavily populated and surrounded by uh, about 400 villages and thousands of inhabitants. Even then, people here live a self-sufficient life uh, owing to paddy fields. Um, the, this is a paddy field here, uh, small kitchen gardens, a backyard ponds, an example of a backyard pond where they rare fish, um, you know, for their consumption. Uh, they also work on shrimp for farms. Uh, this is an example of a shrimp farm and also collect firewood for their cooking needs. Um, it's important to note here that firewood is usually supplemented with alternate sources of energy like cow dung, um, um, rice husks, etc but it is still a very uh, integral part of the cultural landscape here. So 
So to, in order to answer my question, I used a mix of quantitative and qualitative approaches. So to understand harvesting pressures on these forests, uh, we assessed how vegetation composition, structure, biomass, and carbon stocks vary in areas where harvesting is practiced and where it is not. Uh, we sampled a total of 26 plots, each measuring about 10 by 10 meters within seven sites across the sanctuary that represented varying degrees of human access and use. Uh, you can read more about the methods and you know, our results in detail by referring to uh, the paper. Um, which was recently published. Um, if you need a copy, please feel free to email me. Then to understand how social cultural values align with mangrove conservation narratives, a combination of survey and interview methods were used. Um, we um, essentially a traditional survey that tried to capture uh, gender differences in five wood collection patterns uh, was utilized, uh, where a total of uh, 170 participants were asked if they collected firewood for cooking and if they did, whose job was it. We also used a pile sorting exercise where participants uh, place statements in piles of three, uh, those that they agree with, uh, they, those that they disagree with, and those that they don't particularly have an opinion to share. So a list of 30 statements were presented to uh, 41 participants. Um, these these were usually local experts like you know members of self-help uh, certain self-help groups or um leading forest communities etc but also included uh, participants like um ngo staff or uh, forest officials um researchers that have worked in this area and so on the sorts were then analyzed to highlight the spectrum of similarities and dissimilarities between people's uh, responses so this is an example of the 30 statements that were used. Uh, the, as you can see, the topics covered uh, you know, ranged from ecosystem services of mangrove forests, livelihood opportunities, relations with forest officials, and so on. And just to give you an example about livelihood opportunities, this one year talks about how shrimp farming provides livelihood op opportunities and if it's a good source of income for households or no. So participants were essentially asked to, you know, if the statement was presented, participants kind of put the statement in um, in piles of whether they agreed with or disagreed with, or they had a neutral stand. So let's discuss some of these findings to understand how uh, you know different uh, social cultural values and harvesting pressures in this area uh, influence uh, mangrove sustainability in the region. So a traditional survey is in, uh, investigated how much firewood is collect was collected and who does the collection to get an idea about the harvesting pressures in the forest. So this bar graph here summarizes the number of people uh, broken down by gender who agreed that firewood is indeed used as a fuel source for cooking. And among the total individuals that were surveyed, 61% agreed uh, versus 40% 40, 40 denied that they use firewood for cooking. Uh, so among the pile that agreed, 89% suggested that women uh, are primarily involved in the collection of firewood. Also, uh, while uh, important to note here is that while uh, consumption uh, patterns vary, the average value uh, uh, per month per monthly consumption usually uh, stood around 25 kgs, because firewood is almost always supplemented with other forms of fuel sources. And then to understand how harvesting pressures actually uh, impact the mangrove uh, forest structure, composition, and carbon stocks, uh, we looked at harvesting patterns across. Uh, we looked at uh, you know how these uh, factors varied across harvested areas and non-harvested areas, and we found that overall uh, the number of mature trees, saplings, and seedlings were lower in harvested areas was uh, than in non-harvested areas. Similarly, we also found, um, as you know, this is the plot that shows that, um, you know, individuals were lower in harvested than non-harvested plots. Um, similarly, we also found that um, um, the proportion of uh, total carbon stocks was lower in harvested uh, areas than in uh, non-harvested areas. And that, uh, that trend kind of uh, stayed the same for both above ground carbon stocks as well as below ground carbon stocks.
But when we looked at uh, species differences, we found some interesting results. We found that sites where harvesting was common were largely composed of a mix of species types. Um, you can see uh, this graph here. Um, and these were largely dominated, and also these areas were largely dominated by the presence of, say, uh, Avicennia officinalis, as well as uh, Sonoratia, uh, a number of Sonoratia species. species. Whereas uh, non harvested areas uh, showed a strong pe presence of um, exocaria and heritria forms uh, with another number of other um, rare uh, species. So, some key takeaways from the slide here are that um, harvesting can not only influence carbon stocks of the forest, but also impact the in ecological integrity. Um, if you look at this plot here, we see that a number of mangrove associates like, say, Pongamia and uh, Sapium indicum were also found in harvested areas, whereas those were absent in non harvested areas. So, non harvested areas showed um, a much more uh, presence of true species, mangrove species, than mangrove associates. So, this is important to keep in mind. Now, uh, br uh, briefly looking into the so how these uh, you know different harvesting pressures coincide with socio-cultural values, uh, we uh, used a number of uh, survey methods and interview methods to understand people's views towards uh, mangrove conservation narratives. So we found that uh, that the traditional uh, so, uh, you know the pile sorting exercise revealed three distinct uh, perspectives. Uh, and when they were compared with interview responses, they provided greater insight on in how people value these forests. So the three perspectives comprised aspects of livelihood security, uh, conservation value of mangrove forests, and a strong sense of place. So the statements that loaded significantly on the first perspective uh, spoke of how shrimp farming was seen as a lucrative opportunity, as well as you know, the growing migration of village folk to cities in search of jobs. The second described the immense storm protection of uh, you know storm protection value of mangroves as well as other ecosystem services, and the third um, perspective um, you know covered aspects of self identity and uh, and emphasized that the sanctuary was their home and they didn't see rehabilitation and relocation packages as an option. And like I mentioned, if you correspond these statements with uh, quote, quote, interview quotes, it kind of gives you a deeper insight into how people value these forests. Um, so, for example, um, this quote here talks about how people recognize the risk involved in shrimp farming, um, but yet they feel that it is a lucrative opportunity that you know provides livelihood security. Um, then the second quote here talks about how um, you know how deeply people wa value storm protection uh, services of mangroves. Then uh, coming to how people, uh, whether uh, people's local people's views aligned with you know other stakeholders, we just compared how um, different perspectives, um, which participants uh, you know reveal different perspectives, and we found that um, if you look at this graph here, each bar represents uh, the different group of participants. So A and B uh, uh, refer to uh, male and female villagers respectively. Uh, C um, uh, relates to the officials uh, from um, NGOs, the government officials, and uh, E um, researchers or academics um, that have worked in this area. So one of the key takeaways, again, from this slide is that uh, stakeholders such as researchers, NGO workers, and government officials dominated perspective two, that's conservation value of forests. Whereas the other fact, two factors, that's livelihood security and strong sense of place, were dominated by villagers. As you can see, you know, factor one, F1, and F3 uh, are loaded significantly on A and B, whereas they show um, a lower loading uh, strength on the rest of the stakeholders. So as mentioned previously, women mainly collected firewood and were involved in activities that didn't contribute to household income, whereas men were the sole breadwinners of the family. 
Now, these different res differences and responsibilities bring uh, brings out certain subtle differences in how men and women perceive and value the forest differently. For instance, when asked if uh, you know quantity and quality of firewood has declined over the years, uh, women, uh, men, in you know, kind of denied the use and insisted that uh, you know they actually use cylinders now and it's actually improving. Whereas women kind of you know reflected and said that you know we don't cut trees, but you know we only use dry wood. So it kind of nothing it has to do nothing with the quality or quantity of the forest. Um, Similarly, some of the responses also indicated an embedded cultural significance of cooking food, especially rice, uh, using firewood. So when presented with, say, compensation schemes in exchange of firewood collection, uh, men were more open to adopt these schemes. However, women often pause to explain that, you know, everyone prefers eating uh, rice cooked on, you know, the traditional shulhas. Similarly, both men and women found, uh, you know, food uh, or preferred food that was cooked on wood fired, uh, wood fired uh, cook stoves. So, just to summarize and um, whatever we just discussed, um, we found that you know harvesting patterns uh, show both ecological degradation um, and low carbon stocks, but kind of have uh, some potential for conservation opportunities. Um, women uh, we also found that women are primarily involved in forest uh, extraction activities um and therefore it's kind of crucial for conservation plans to be inclusive of communities lived realities and in, so involving women and other marginalized communities in decision making is needed for successful outcomes we also found uh, you know um, value perspectives differ among local and extra local interviewees uh, which brings us to the discussion that you know on the surface, exclusion kind of assumes a reduction in people forest uh, interactions when use uh, still continues. And this is not to say that protected areas are not successful in conserving forests. They work because they have been operational for years in the country, but combining alternate uh, inclusive plans can help them make, uh, you know, help them be more successful. Um, for example, you, uh, community managed woodlots can be an option where communities have access to these areas uh, to sustain their needs and also have the ability to manage these areas without interference. And lastly, to note is that people were interested in incentive based programs for man towards mangrove conservations, uh, but they also exclaim that uh, while these incentive based programs uh, were needed, um, people, um, you know, officials to recognize their lived realities. So um, that's it for today, and um, I hope you enjoyed my talk. And if you have questions, um, please feel to get in touch with me. Um, I um, my email ID is mentioned in the last slide here. Um, and just before. Um, um, wrapping up for wrapping up this talk, I'd like to acknowledge uh, different people who've contributed uh, in different ways um, um, towards my research and without whom or without their help and guidance, it wouldn't have been possible. So yeah, thank you. And um, please email me if you have questions. Thank you. So, uh... Yeah, with, with that, uh, we came to an end to this uh, talk session. And uh, so uh, since uh, Dina could not join us directly, I request all the participants to put their uh, questions in the Q&A box uh, that will be forwarded to Dina or uh, any panelists or, expert, uh, or uh, experts in the uh, resource persons list could answer. If, if Feel free to answer any anything that you could do and uh, all otherwise all the questions will be forwarded to dina and uh, dina's email is there in the uh, presentation i hope uh, people made a note of it if you 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 want to keep in touch with her you can uh, do it by email or you uh, we can forward those questions and get the answers so uh, yeah so with that we come to an end to the uh, second session and uh, so uh, we will be shortly starting the panel discussion. So uh, uh, do we have all the panel members?
joined us Vito can you quickly check We have Professor Sadamani Das with us. We have Dr. R. Subramanian. And okay. I believe uh, Professor Ruthi Padola will be joining shortly, but we can get okay. started. Yes. So, uh, yeah, uh, I think uh, I checked with uh, Dr. Professor Ruchi, and she will be joining us shortly. Uh, to, uh, we will wait for two more minutes to begin and once she joined we will start the panel discussion is that okay it looks like uh, dr nehru is um, his video is not on but i believe we have uh, all panel members here so um, in the interest of time uh, we can get started and uh, i will start by giving a brief introduction of this panel session. We will have three panel members today. And in that, we'll uh, start with our first speaker, which is Professor Sodamini Das. Uh, she is uh, a professor at the uh, uh, Institute of uh, Economic Growth, New Delhi and also a fellow of South Asian Network for Development and Environmental Economics. She worked as Malar Scholar at the Beiser Institute of Ecological Economics, Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, Stockholm during 2011 and 2012. Her research areas are ecosystem services of mangroves, climate change adaptation, assessment of loss and damage to livelihood due to climate change, valuation of ecosystem services, coastal vulnerability analysis, and evaluation of public policy. She has uh, published extensively in high ranking journals like PNAS, uh, World Development, Climate Change Economics, Nature Hazard, Estuarine and Coastal Shelf uh, Sciences, and she has uh, advised uh, students in her illustrious career. So without further ado, I will invite Professor Das. And uh, uh, just a brief note to have some time for discussion. We'll really appreciate if uh, you can keep your presentation to the allocated time. The floor is yours, uh, Dr. Das. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good morning to all of you. So many friends uh, in the list. So it's a great pleasure to be here and thanks a lot for this invitation. I'm so happy to share my research with all the illustrious people who are there in the panel as well as among the audience. It's a great, great honor to be with you all. So let me just share my screen. So I hope uh, this is visible now. Yes, it's visible. Thank it's you very cool. much. So this is what I'm going to talk about, how mangroves are playing a role in building a coastal resilience against natural disaster. And mostly I'll be talking based on my own research. And I hope, you know, if there are any questions in between or, you know, clarificated anything, so everybody, I'll be very happy people, people do ask it in between. So let me just go straight uh, this very preliminary slide I wanted to show everybody that, you know, how do you say resilience? How do you define this resilience? So there are these four points. There is one line called PP. So this is called the pre, uh, you know, disaster. So the, the initial condition, suppose one individual is at this level point P, and then after a disaster, the person can fall back to A or to B. So that means the person is suffering damages, so he or she is losing uh, uh, the well-being, and as a result, their, their economic well-being is going down. If they are reaching point A compared to point B, then point A is called static resilient because they are suffering less. And after recovery, they can come to point C or they can come to point D, so they take different path to recover. So if they are taking either path one or a path two and reaching the disaster situation, the point C very quickly, then they are also called dynamically resilient. So how much you suffer after the disaster and how quickly you recover back 
defining or resilience or the recovery. So when you have mangroves in a coastal area, as you also see in my slides later on, mangroves are able to provide both static resilience because they reduce the damage during a disaster. And they also provide you a dynamic resilience because help people to recover quickly. Like at the three and four are called the dynamically non-resilient and one and two are called dynamically resilient. So whosoever, whichever villagers, households are having mangrove in their coastal distance, they seem to be recovering very quickly. So that is why mangroves are really essential to have in the coastal area so that, and like with the climate change, uh, the disasters uh, you know, frequency and intensity are increasing so quickly, so fast. So it's essential that we need to have mangroves to provide resilience to the people. So now why they're resilient? And these are the you know, few things I say in defense of mangroves. Mangroves provide both static and dynamic resilience. They protect lives, properties, and livelihoods. They provide fast line of defense during a coastal calamity. They equally effective as shelters and other non-man-made protection sources. They are the most effective coastal green belt compared to other coastal vegetation. So if you have any other vegetation in a mangrove habitat, obviously they don't you know, protect like a mangrove. So these are some of the regions which are also based on very you know, careful research that says that it's essential to have mangroves in the mangrove habitat to uh, build up the resilience or to face to adapt to the coastal disasters like storms. These are some of the features that are very prominent because of this root structure. Mangroves are able to provide you know, continuous resistance to the storm source. They act like a wall. They channelize water because they are there in the both sides of the water channel. So water do not go here and there. So these are the, some of the very prominent features that provide storm protection during a calamity like tsunami and cyclone. So like now, I'm doing, going to my first study. This is a very old study. Many of the people in the audience would be knowing about it. I studied the uh, storm protection of mangroves during the super cyclone that came to Orissa in the year 1999. So as you can see here, the, this red patch is the, my study area, which was in the thick of the cyclone uh, impact zone. And this diagrams on the right tells you that Odisha had not many mangroves in 1940s and 50s and when the super cyclone came most of it 80 percent of it were destroyed so one district had all the mangroves gone and in the Kendrapada district little mangroves were there so this red patches as you can see here so nearly half of the mangroves were destroyed when the super cyclone came to Orissa in Kendrapada district and 100 percent mangroves were destroyed in the Jagasimpur district that was the cyclone landfall point so my research question was that these little mangroves that were there in Odisha during nine hours before the cyclone, did they provide any storm protection? And if the mangroves were not destroyed, what would have been the situation? I tried to examine this, taking human death and also property damages into account. So I, so you can see here, initially when I plotted the death figures, you can see the only area that did not have death at all were the ones behind the mangrove block, only this area, whereas we had death uh, beyond the mangrove area, we had also a lot of death before that. And when I did a you know simple tabular comparison, you can see here the entire district had the average death was uh, this is the Kendrapada district uh, 0 0.4, and mangroves with no protection, the death toll was 0 0.5. Mangroves with more mangrove, mangrove protection was 0 0.1. And there are villages, there are some 92 villages established after cutting down the mangroves. These are the villages in this patch and also in this patch. The average death was 1.11, so high. Almost every village had a death. And villages outside the mangrove habitat, the death was also low. So this made it very clear that probably, probably mangroves provided a protection to human lives during the cyclone. So I estimated a cyclone damage function. As you can see, this was a uh, interdisciplinary complicated damage function we estimated. And in the model, we had a lot many controls and not going much detail into that. So you can see here that we had controls in the model that control for the physical features of the mangrove habitat, cyclone impact, topography, hydrology, infrastructure, social well-being, as well as governmental institutions. And from the marginal effect, I try to measure the death averted by mangroves. These are some very simple results you can see here in the area that the villages I studied that had the potential to be protected by mangroves. 392 people died, and if there are no mangroves, then 603 people would have died. So if you see the difference, mangroves that existed before the super cyclone could avert 111 deaths. 
And if the historical mangroves in 1940s and 50s were not destroyed, only 31 people would have died. That says 361 deaths could have been averted, 92% of the deaths could have been averted if the mangroves were not destroyed. So that was a very strong you know, um, evidence that mangroves do protect lives during a cyclone when you do not have so many others. Though government of Orissa did try to evacuate people and also had very few storm shelters during that cyclone, but still mangrove played a very, very crucial role in protecting protecting lives. Then I would try also try to examine whether mangroves provide wind protection. This was the study, I think, that for the first time examined whether mangroves uh, do provide strong protection from cyclonic wind. Because earlier, the hypothesis, hypothesis was that mangroves pro you know, provide protection from storm surge. So the, here we try to examine the question of wind protection, and we did a special model. And this one model is well explained in our publication that came out in Estuarian and Coastal Self Sciences in 2013. So what we did here, so we took all the villages and for each of the villages, we measured the potential uh, cyclonic wind and the potential damage and compared it to the actual damage. And from the difference of the potential damage and the actual damage, we try to measure the uh, volume of storm protection uh, given by the mangroves. And these were the results you can see here. Uh, given the cyclone impact, if a particular village is having 194 uh, kilometer of wind velocity from the storm, the having mangroves will make the damage this much, and without mangroves, the damage is this much. So the gap, you know, very clearly tells you the extent of uh, uh, wind protection provided by mangroves to the houses. As uh, like in 99, 85% of the houses in Kendrapara district were kacha structures, you know, mud structures. And still, even in spite of that, the mud structure houses were protected by the mangroves. And you can see how the higher the impact of the storm, the more is the gap between the and the house damage of the non-protected villages and the protected villages. So that tells a lot about the wind protection by the mangroves. And also we try to you know, compare this for villages very close to the landfall and villages away from the landfall. As you can see here, villages close to the landfall had so much of protection. The mangrove uh, protected villages are having you know, continually very, very low uh, damages. And this damage is there 30 kilometers from the coast. So now then uh, the next in a recent study, I'm trying to you know compare how mangroves are, uh, the protection from mangroves are compared to cyclone shelters, early warning, and also cross dikes. This is because, you know, like uh, we had the super cyclone and we don't have a similar cyclone hitting the area, the mangrove areas uh, till date. So I am trying to reconstitute the 99 situation, uh, taking the present scenario. Three questions I'm examining in this particular study. With modern cyclone disaster management, where you have 100 high investment in manufactured capital for storm protection, are storm protection services of mangrove still valid? Like now that we have hundreds of storm shelters, are mangrove still in Important to get storm protection. How does the storm protection by mangroves compare to those from the built capital sources like shelters and early warning? Are technological substitutes perfect substitutes of regulating or provisioning ecosystem services? These are the three important questions I'm trying to examine. And to do this, I'm you know estimating models which are similar to my previous studies and also but more extensive with more data and you know uh, more rigorous econometric estimation account for the presence of large number of shelters, training, and knowledge sharing in the model, estimate death averted by mangrove shelters and early warning under different scenarios. Just giving you, you know, two results. So these are the different models not going much uh, into the detail. And under different assumptions, you can see there are three uh, uh, averted death I'm measuring. The, this one is actual death. Death in absence of mangrove, death in absence of early warning, and death in absence of shelter. So this is the situation as exist, existed in 99. And you can see here the bracketed figures. These are the bracketed figures, death aborted by mangrove. And they're very much comparable to death aborted by shelters. Though early warnings has a much stronger effect, but mangroves are also giving you protection, which is more or less similar to the protection provided by the shelters. Then in the next situation, I thought, okay, suppose in 99 we had uh, the situation, the, the situation in 99 would have been similar as in 2013, where we had hundreds of you know cyclone shelters in Orissa. At least here I'm accounting for uh, 32 cyclone shelters plus 53 flood shelters in my study area. So you shall see this is at uh, how much 95 uh, shelters uh, in those villages. As you can see here, the protection by mangroves is not coming back to zero. 
they're still important. In spite of you do so much of investment in some shelters, you have so many and you have so much of uh, aluminum, dissemination, training, and you know, I mean, all villagers are having uh, shelters and shelter management committee, that, that village tax force. In spite of that, Magdo Sat did do that. They're still able to protect some lives and you know, which are not so uh, few. So that means, in spite of all the modern uh, cyclone disaster management, you cannot say that mangroves are not important. They're still important to provide storm protection. And then this is another study where I try to see the you know vulnerability of the villages. So I say the villages, uh, I'm, I'm measuring the probability of death. If a super cyclone is hitting the area, if the village is having a probability of death, which is more than 60%, they are called vulnerable. And if the probability of death is less than 0.006, that means nearly zero, then they are called the least vulnerable. You can see here, the villages most vulnerable are the ones which are established after cutting down the mangroves, the mangrove habitat villages. And the villages which are least vulnerable are the ones which are sheltered behind the mangroves. So that again says, you know, how important it is to have mangroves. If we Retain mangroves, you are least vulnerable. If you cut down mangroves and have your villages in a mangrove habitat, then you are the most vulnerable. So that says a lot about how mangroves provide protection to villages during a calamity. And also recently, this is based on the project which was uh, you know, done by my panelist, Dr. Rama Subramaniam. So I visited in uh, you know, one of his project site and we did a perception study and we try to find out what is the perception of mangrove to adapt to sea level rise in the present climate change context scenario. And you can see here people give the score out of five. So you can see here, so, uh, they gave a score of 4.3 erosion prevention. Mangrove people are so emotionally attached to mangrove and there is so much of demand that mangroves should be planted in the areas which is having open cost. And because they feel mangroves will you know, reduce the soil erosion. And you know, some of the people, they did say that, okay, now that the mangroves are there, we are sure that we are going to survive. Without a mangrove, the sea would have eaten away our houses. And similarly, they also gave a very high score that mangroves, uh, you know, indirect contribution to poverty reduction is 4.4. So that means though mangroves are not directly uh, providing uh, any, uh, was making any contribution to reduce poverty. And because they are saving our livelihood, they're saving our life, that indirect contribution to reduce poverty is very, very high, you know, 4.4 out of 5. And similarly, adapting to sea level rise, you know, the, the villagers feel, you know, this is so high. Almost all the three villages we studied, so they gave four, a score of 4 out of 5. And then to the question whether mangroves should be planted uh, in other areas, you know, the score was again very, very high, yes they should also be planted in other areas. So this says the local people also give high priority to mangrove planting and mangrove regeneration to adapt to climate change scenarios. Okay. Uh, this is another study I did in uh, Gujarat where you know, I'm just coming back to uh, mangrove regeneration. This is the mangrove scenario in India. As you can see here, like on, in almost every state, the mangrove cover is going up. This is the difference in the mangrove cover in between 2011 and 1987. But the state of Gujarat has done extreme, you know, I think extensively well. They have nearly doubled their mangrove cover uh, coverage over the years. I tried to see what has been the contribution of these uh, mangroves to uh, the fishery sector of the state. I'm not going into those details, but maybe I'll just uh, touch upon some of the issues on this mangrove regeneration. So like you can see here, to start with, Gujarat has 854 uh, square kilometers of mangrove in 1939, and by 1990, they were again 873. But the thing is that there's a lot of difference. They also destroyed a lot of their mangroves, but they also continuously started regenerating. Mangrove uh, plantation is a continuous scheme in Gujarat since 1950s. So though uh, mangroves are destroyed in some area, areas, they are regenerated in some other areas, so the mangroves were still there. And by 2013, the cover has been nearly doubled. Now, the thing is that they are planting mangroves all along the coast. But I think there is some care need to be taken. I have highlighted these, you know, bugs in a day. So these are the non-mangrove habitat, and they are planting mangroves, so they are not successful. So you can see there the mangrove cover in 90, 2013. They did not have mangroves in 1990s. 
sorry, in uh, 1950s, but they started planting uh, in the mud flats, but they do not survive. Whereas in the mangrove habitat, the mangroves survive and they are still existing. So this is what one really needs to be in the same situation. Also, I try to uh, show here so that you know when we do go for a mangrove regeneration and mangrove planting, it should be really taken into account whether the area is a mangrove habitat or not. If we do it in mangrove habitat, then this is a bogus plantation because they don't survive. Like in this Dolka block, they had uh, seven square kilometer of mangrove in the 90s, but they all died. So by um, Similarly, also in other districts, they had 19 square kilometer and by 2013, only eight square kilometers survived. So these are the things that really needs to be taken into account. So if some of these details are there in Team India study that we did for um, Gujarat state. So this needs to be taken into account while doing the mangrove uh, regeneration. So now uh, to give you some of this, my concluding uh, remark, natural buffers like mangrove important role in managing storm risks, which is you know established very very conclusively and this is a globally accepted uh, hypothesis now evacuation has been a prioritized reducing risks to life the concept of resilient building is yet to be talked about so now this concept has not taken taken up in india so this increases the importance of natural backwards my man too so that we receive storm protection um, at least from the cyclonic wind now, this the third point, and that's very crucial, is that buffers need to be maintained along the coast in continuous lines until habitat exists. Patchy buffers can be more damaging. If you have mangroves in patchy buffers, at least some of my results shows that in those areas which are having discontinuous mangroves, they try to suffer more. So it's essential that we maintain mangroves continuously in until the habitat exists. Ecological regeneration and restoration should be preferred convenient restoration. Wherever you think you know, it's convenient to plant mangroves, the government is doing that in some of the areas, some of the state, but that should be avoided. Ecological regeneration and restoration should be given the priority. And then non-habitat plantation should be discouraged. You know, like wherever uh, you never had a mangrove, they should not try to uh, plant mangroves over there. So these are some of the brief things that I try to share based on my previous results. Though presently I'm not doing much work on mangroves, but I thought, you know, whatever I've done before, I should share with you. So I thank you all for uh, listening to my presentation. And I stop here. Thank you, Professor Das. Thank you for sharing all the details of your previous uh, work, both from the East Coast and the West Coast, and giving uh, providing uh, uh, your insights from uh, surveys that you have conducted, and uh, in in combination with uh, our next speaker, uh, Dr. Ramasubramanian, which is really good because then it becomes easy. It's kind it's kind of continuation of the story. So our next panel member is Dr. R. Ramasubramanian from MS Swaminathan Research Foundation. I'll quickly provide his introduction and then hand it over to uh, floor to him. Uh, so Dr. Ramasubramanian com completed his doctorate from Center of Advanced Study in Botany, University of Madras before joining MSSRF in 1996 as scientist and mangrove biologist. He has carried out extensive biophysical surveys in Godavari and Krishna mangrove wetlands of Andhra Pradesh and played an important role in executing mangrove restoration activities jointly with stakeholders such as local community, forest department, and NGOs in Andhra Pradesh. This has led to restoration of about 900 hectares of mangrove. He has authored various uh, books and manuals, particularly mangrove identification manual and mangrove nursery and mangrove restoration techniques are widely used by forest department field staff. He has trained a large number of community members as well as forest department staff on mangrove silviculture practices. He has also authored uh, a lot of paper almost 20 peer review publication in journals and co-authored five books and 10 chapters. So we have great pleasure of having you sir with us and i hand over to you to share your insights and thoughts um just quick uh, mention try to to stay within the allocated time thank you sir thank you very much uh, for the organizers uh, providing this opportunity and uh, i'll just share my screen hope oh, is it visible Yes. Yeah. Um, Kindly make it full screen, please. 
ja, tästä. Ja. Yes. Good to go. So, uh, mangroves are very important uh, coastal resources, especially to the uh, artisanal fishermen who are all depending on the livelihood. Because uh, the coastal uh, uh, livelihood, if you see, a lot of uh, small uh, fishermen, they used to go inside the mangrove forest either by walk or small um, uh, non motorized boats. So, they will be harvesting these resources for their livelihood. So, apart from that, um, Many ecosystem services, uh, more than 70 ecosystem services mangroves provide. Uh, most important is livelihood as well as uh, the uh, bioshield function of the mangroves because uh, of the extensive root system. If you see the mangrove the root system, these are also the root uh, systems, you can see the maze like structures. Because of these, uh, these plants are able to withstand the uh, high wind velocity of more than 200 uh, kilometers per hour just now. Uh, so, Ramani Das has mentioned about super cyclone in Larissa. So, because of this root system, these plants are able to withstand the wind speed as well as the water velocity. Apart from that, it provides shelter to juvenile fisheries, which actually uh, gives a lot of livelihood uh, opportunity for the coastal uh, communities. So, yesterday, Dr. It appears we have lost connection. Vito, can you hear him? Yes, I think Dr. Ramas Subramian has lost his internet connection. He's back now. Yeah. Dr. Ramas Subramanian, I think you are muted. You have to share your screen again. Yeah. Oh, sorry, something went wrong. So probably earlier. Now it is visible. Yes, please carry on. Yeah. This slide have you seen that? There is some issue. Yeah, uh, we are seeing distribution of mangroves in India. So if yeah. you want to. Yeah, this slide, uh, uh, Dr. Kadireshan and others yesterday uh, uh, spoke about the carbon sequestration potential of uh, the coastal resources. And once these resources are uh, destroyed or uh, uh, removed, the, whatever the carbon stored inside the uh, soil will be uh, emitted. So it will add to the carbon budget to the atmosphere. So this is about the extent of mangrove. We have we have mangroves in both east and west coast, uh, as well as in Andaman and Nicobar Islands. So I'm not going to into the details. So uh, if you see the mangrove wetland uh, somewhere in 1980s or 90s, uh, more than 50 percent of the area are all degraded because of various reasons. One of the reasons uh, was the past management practices. Still. Uh, in 1978, uh, mangrove uh, forests were cut down by the government to meet the fuel requirement of the community. So, because of these fillings, some of the areas uh, were could not able to regenerate on its own, and due to various reasons. And apart from that, uh, the local community uh, still now uh, depends on the mangroves for their domestic needs. Uh, as well as uh, some of the livestock, especially in uh, Krishna and Godavari districts. Uh, if you see more than 2,000 uh, cattle will be residing inside the mangroves, they will be grazing, and uh, the uh, farmers used to go in a boat and fetch the milk. But now it has come down due to various um, issues, like uh, one is the uh, forest department is enforcing very strict uh, uh, measures. But from that, uh, they are also feeling uh, uh, cumbersome in going into the mangroves and bringing uh, milk. So changes in the land use is one of the major uh, 
factor in producing the mangrove extent, not only in India, but also in all the all over the world, especially in South Asian countries, aquaculture is a major threat to the mangroves. Apart from that, agriculture industries and other habitations also have been established and inside the mangroves. Uh, some of the natural causes are like changes in the topography. Actually, during monsoon, uh, sediments are being brought and deposited along the uh, river as well as in trees. And uh, it prevents the uh, tidal water flow inside the uh, mangroves. And uh, uh, some of the river mouths, uh, because of lack of a uh, uh, lot of quantum of uh, fresh water, they have been closed. So, which will reduce uh, the fresh water inflow as well as uh, the tidal water flow. So, because of that, some of the mangroves have been degraded. Cyclones uh, during 90, uh, 1977, uh, we had a Divisima cyclone in uh, Krishna district of Andhra Pradesh, as well as in recent uh, Gaja. 2018, we had in Muthupet, similarly in Nargis. These cyclones also have uh, damage. If you see in uh, Muthupet, large area have been uh, destroyed. So, similarly in Nargis, more than 58,000 hectares of mangroves have been uh, destructed. Even uh, in Andaman, the tsunami, um, more than uh, 20 square kilometers of mangroves have been uh, destroyed. So, climate change is also one of the uh, major cause for. Uh, 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 mangrove loss should uh, die back. This is uh, been reported that I will be showing you. This is how the local community is depending on the mangroves for their livelihood as well as their domestic needs. Uh, these are some of the uh, practices of uh, land use uh, very close to the mangroves and where are uh, the mangroves were there in private land as well as in the revenue land they were cleared for aquaculture uh, for habitations. So. Uh, because of these, uh, uh, large areas, especially in Andhra Pradesh, have been uh, reduced uh, because of aquaculture. So there is lack of coordination because uh, the government itself have given permission and, uh, to start uh, aquaculture in their own lands. So they have cleared uh, their uh, mangroves and started uh, aquaculture. So there is lack of coordination because in the revenue records, if you see, uh, there is a mention of our only wasteland or uh, some wetland. They are not uh, put as a mangroves. So, but uh, now due to awareness as well as a uh, lot of uh, um, PIL and other um, uh, judiciary uh, regulations, some of these mangroves are brought back to the uh, fold. So this is the uh, satellite imagery of uh, Godavari Delta, where we have been working for more than 25 years. So left side is uh, 1986 uh, and right side is uh, 2001. Uh, you can see this area, this area uh, in, during 90s, uh, uh, 1990s, uh, there were mangroves. But uh, later in 2000, a large area of uh, mangroves were uh, cut down and uh, aquaculture have been practiced because of uh, some of the land uh, the government has provided uh, rights to the local community to start up this uh, aquaculture, as well as some of the private lands. Earlier, we, they were with mangroves, they were allowed to cut and uh, started doing aquaculture. So, this is uh, one study uh, carried out the same place. So, you can see in 1977, large mangroves were there. And, uh, in 1999, most of these mangroves were cleared and uh, aquaculture has been started. So, earlier uh, uh, in 1990s, uh, India, we lost about 40,000 uh, percent of the mangrove area in India. So, of which, if you see in Andhra, uh, in East Okada district alone, uh, more than uh, 2,187 hectares of uh, Mangroves have been destructed for aquaculture. So you can see uh, in the area uh, very close to these uh, mangroves were converted for aquaculture. Then uh, some of the areas uh, naturally, uh, uh, natural regeneration, as well as these are the areas uh, uh, mangrove uh, artificial uh, plantation have been done and it has come. So this is the status of uh, mangroves of uh, Krishna Delta. In 1986 and uh, 2001, if we compare, uh, large areas of uh, mangroves were cleared for aquaculture. 
you can see this area, large areas were converted to that. So this is about uh, the Kaja cyclone we had in Uttupet in uh, 2018. Uh, this is uh, before uh, Kaja, you can see the mangroves uh, lining along the coast as well as in this uh, area. So after cyclone, uh, uh, December 2018, we produced the image and the found that large areas of uh, mangroves have been uh, descriptive. The same thing, uh, these are the uh, Google image. You can see the uh, dense mangrove plant uh, mangrove in uh, Muthupet in January 2018. And this is the image of uh, uh, February 2020, where uh, still a uh, lot uh, area of mangroves were descriptive. So the co-basing capacity of these mangroves uh, are not good due to various reasons. Even though Abyssinia is one of the best uh, co-pieces in mangroves, uh, in spite of that, uh, these mangroves uh, could not be come back on this home. So th this is how the, uh, these are some of the photographs of the uh, cyclone Gaja, which has impacted the uh, plate. So large trees have been uh, fallen down. Only very few species uh, are able to co -piece. So this is uh, due to sea level rise, as uh, Dr. Shivakumar has pointed out. Uh, this is the Badari Delta where uh, because of uh, sea level rise and uh, uh, wave action, some of the mangroves along the coast have been eroding at an alarming rate. So uh, this is the uh, picture taken in uh, Bichara mangroves where uh, they were lost due to uh, lack of uh, proper uh, tidal flushing as well as uh, raising temperature. Because of these, uh, some of the mangroves in uh, Tamil Nadu, both Muthupet and Pichavaram, uh, uh, were affected. So, MS Swaminathan Research Foundation as well as the State Forest Departments initiated uh, uh, mangrove conservation uh, measures by restoring some of the uh, degraded areas through canals. So we have dug canals, we have raised uh, nursery involving the local community. So local community played a major role in mangrove restoration. So we have planted uh, the mangrove saplings uh, along the canals. And this is the process we have followed. Uh, we mobilized the community. We have built their capacity to plant mangroves. We have taken uh, them to the villages where uh, these systems are being in place. So we identified the area for planting, then we prepared a joint plan and implemented that. So this is a typical degraded area in the Krishna district uh, where large areas of uh, uh, mangroves were felled earlier, could not come on its own. So we dug canals like this during high tide water enters. Uh, if you see the poor water salinity there, uh, it, it was uh, more than 100 ppg. So because of that, uh, Nothing except few halophytes like sueda, nothing has grown. So we dug canals like these during high tide water enters and during low tide receives. During Due to these tidal flushing, some of the salts uh, are removed and it, is, it has become a conducive environment for the mangroves to grow. So this is another area in uh, Godavari Delta. These are all the sueda. You can see only halophytes in those areas. So this is a Krishna. Area, it is about more than 200 hectares. So, we dug uh, trebicidal canals like this and we have planted mangroves. So, this is how uh, the local community is involved in uh, nursery as well as uh, uh, mangrove restoration works. So, we have done uh, mangrove restoration uh, in 2003 in a village called uh, Badi Muga in Godavari district. Uh, you can see. Uh, after 10 years, uh, we, uh, we got about uh, six to seven feet of uh, mangroves. And uh, now, if you see the image of uh, 2021 Google Earth, uh, almost this area has been completely uh, restored. Uh, similarly, you can see large areas of uh, plantations done by the forest department. You can see the uh, rows and all like this. So, these are all uh, uh, mangrove restored areas uh, by the forest department. I think I will let them see. So this is again we did it in uh, Krishna district. Uh, you can see the images. So these are all our mangrove plantation. They are all 10 years old. And now it has become almost a thick forest cover. 
So coming to the mangrove cover of Andhra Pradesh, uh, during 1987, uh, uh, Andhra had about uh, nearly 4, 495 square kilometers of mangroves. Uh, due to aquaculture, large areas, as I already told, most of the areas in the revenue as well as uh, the private lands were converted um, to aquaf farms. Because of that, the extent has uh, fallen down to 325 uh, square kilometers somewhere in 2001. But due to natural regeneration, as well as the efforts of the uh, forest department, as well as Mr. Sarah, uh, it has uh, come on around uh, 400 square kilometers. Was 405 in 2019. So these are some of the areas, uh, satellite images, uh, if you, the land use land cover of 2000, uh, you see large degraded areas where they are inside the uh, mango forest have been completely restored through artificial regeneration. This is a 2020 image. Uh, this is in Krishna, you can see in Krishna uh, in 1996, uh, the extent of uh, moderate uh, uh, density of mangrove was around 7,000 uh, hectares. Uh, if, you, if you see the image of uh, uh, 2020, almost it has become doubled. Uh, now the moderate dense mangrove cover is about 15,000 hectares. So this is the FSA uh, data they have been uh, publishing every two years. So the other day, if you see, uh, I told you, uh, from 495, it has come to 329 uh, in 2003. Now it has uh, regained nearly to 404. But uh, if you see the other states like uh, Gujarat, it was uh, 427. Now it has increased almost to three uh, folds, that is 1200. So some of the states like Maharashtra, uh, Odisha, they are all improved well. And Tamil Nadu also, it was there only around 23 square kilometers. Now it has become doubled. Uh, one day in Andama, uh, Andhra Pradesh and Andaman had uh, slightly reduced mangrove cover when you compare uh, 1987. So the increase in forest cover uh, in the recent years is due to both natural as well as uh, mangrove restoration carried out by the different agencies. So apart from that, the dependency on the mangroves by the local community have also come down due to um, earlier they were using for uh, house construction, but uh, now uh, almost uh, all the villages have permanent houses, so they are not depending on the housing for uh, timber. Then uh, like that, the dependence even for fuel wood, uh, most of them have been using only uh, LPG stoves and other things. Uh, apart from that, uh, sea level rise also helped uh, to increase in, uh, the mangrove cover because some of the elevated areas now receive uh, tidal water flow of about uh, two to three inches. Because of that, those areas now started uh, regenerating on its own. Uh, one major uh, uh, mangrove cover increase is due to abandoning of stream ponds in the revenue lands. So because of uh, widespread diseases, so that also major cause for increasing the mangrove cover. Apart from that, uh, strict enforcement of um, laws, uh, CRZ and uh, NGT played a major role in uh, regaining some of the lands for Nagro. Uh, and among, uh, awareness also now increased among the community. So these are the images where you can see the abandoned stream farms uh, having a lot of mangroves in both in Krishna as well as Godavari Delta. Uh, this is about the uh, images of uh, which are around, where in uh, 1988 uh, we had about 400 uh, hectares of mangroves, but uh, now if you see it has increased to 795 hectares, almost it has doubled. Uh, one of the other major issue is the reduction in the freshwater flow. So this is the uh, Krishna Delta. Uh, in uh, 1951, uh, uh, the mangroves received nearly 60 cubic uh, kilometers of water, but due to the construction of different dams, so now uh, it has almost reduced to 5 uh, cubic kilometers. Because of this, uh, uh, large areas of uh, mangroves have been uh, stunted because uh, the uh, salinity levels in the soil as well as the water has been uh, increased. Even the sediment flow 
which is very much uh, required because sediments carry a lot of uh, nutrients as well as uh, it will uh, build the estuary. Because of lack of uh, freshwater flow with the sediments, uh, now the mangroves of Krishna is uh, starving. Dr. Ramasubramanian, uh, Dr. it's very you, interesting, but... Uh, just two minutes, I will uh, be closing. Uh, this is about the Pichar mangroves. So, this is my last slide. So, some of the gaps, uh, actually, uh, nobody is uh, very much clear how much freshwater flow is uh, essential. So, it has to be uh, carried out for different uh, estuaries. Then, wherever uh, the areas are suitable, I, those areas should be uh, worked and uh, restored. So, among the uh, different the players are there. The revenue department has some area. So, there should be a coordination to protect these values. So even now, if you see, a uh, lot of areas are all unprotected. So it has to be coming, uh, it has to brought to a common uh, uh, pool so that it can be protected well. So apart from that, uh, uh, aquaculture farmers also should be encouraged to plant mangroves. Then barmouth closure is one of the major issues that has to be uh, tackled to get a good uh, freshwater flow as well as the tidal water flow. Then um, some of the uh, communities are depending on uh, mangroves for their domestic needs. That needs to be addressed. Then invasion of prosperity is prominent in some of the episodes like Mukhe, then in Krishna, that has to be covered. Thank you very much. This is my last slide. Thank you, Dr. Ramasabramanian. It's it's very, very illustrious presentation. And I think it's important that your presentation covered two important topics that came up yesterday. There was a question about uh, um, someone asking whether these canals were dug by hand, and you had a picture with the uh, with the person digging the canal. So I think that answers the uh, one of the questions. Another important thing that we discussed yesterday was about restoring hydrology and how oh, and why this is important. So that was clearly highlighted. It was very very interesting and, and, and insightful. So without further ado, let's move on to our next panelist, which is Professor Ruchi Patola from Wildlife Institute of India. She she is a senior professor uh, and heads the Department of Eco Development Planning and Participatory Management at WII, Dehradun. She has conducted applied research on various aspects of wildlife management and eco development planning, human wildlife conflict mitigation, valuation of ecosystem services, livelihood development, covering almost all states within the country. She has developed management plans for seven wetlands of conservation importance in the states of Manipur, Bihar, Punjab, Uttar Pradesh, and Uttarakhand. She has developed and implemented pioneer training programs in human dimensions of wildlife conservation, and she has published over more than 100 peer-reviewed articles in journal and international uh, journals of international repute, books, and book chapter. So it is our great pleasure to have her here and share her views on the biodiversity aspect of mangroves, perhaps, and, and why that is important. The floor is yours, Professor Badullah. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rupesh. And it is a great opportunity for me to reflect on some of my mangrove work, uh, which was done largely in uh, uh, Odisha. And I will uh, be talking about the from the community part of it, because my work largely focused on the community part of the mangrove work. Let me share my presentation. So. I think it is, yeah. So basically, uh, if we look at the global distribution of mangrove loss and its drivers in our part of the world, the major drivers of mangrove loss have been the demand for commodities, that is extraction of resources and conversion, particularly along the east coast of India, if we see, rather than you know uh, extreme weather events or erosion, of course, those have been important, but it has largely been the demand for the mangrove resources as well as the conversions into other uses. We do realize that mangroves provide a critical ecosystem services, some of which have been reflected uh, by my previous colleagues. And very important are the regulating services that mangroves provide. And our work on mangroves actually initiated with looking at some of these important regulating uh, services, including the storm protection, nutrient uh, retention, and uh, contribution to the fisheries in the area. 
And uh, if we look at some of the uh, important studies, uh, there are uh, studies which have documented the ecosystem value of selected regulation functions of mangroves, uh, including uh, Dr. Sodamani's excellent work on storm protection in, in which she has really con made a lot of contribution in uh, you know, contributing to this field of uh, mangrove functions. And apart from that, uh, global studies, but the point is that despite this, I would say that we do not have a large number of studies on these. You know, these are some of the important studies that I'm present, uh, saying here, but uh, there are not, not many, many more studies on these dimensions. So I will briefly go into our own uh, work in Bhitar Kanika. And uh, as you are well aware that Bhitar Kanika is uh, one of the second largest mangrove areas of the country in the East Coast. And now the man mangrove uh, areas are largely confined into the sanctuary area which is about 150 square kilometers. And a uh, large number of villages are situated in this area, more than 300 uh, villages. And uh, people in these villages are poor and uh, lack of access to basic facilities, uh, family income being low. And most of them are also settlers from the neighboring states. So the stakes uh, become uh, you know, uh, very different. And uh, um, uh, they, are, they are using the different mangrove uh, species in different ways for meeting their day-to-day -day requirements, as well as for you know, earning their livelihoods. So right from timber, firewood, thatching material to weaving material, it is being used. And uh, these are some of the uses to which uh, mangroves are being put in this area. And uh, even from the sanctuary area, there is a dependence for biomass by the local people, including uh, fuel wood, fish, timber, honey, and other products, and which is very, very important uh, contributor to the income of these people here. And you can see that even for uh, you know, commercial purposes, some of these resources, I mean, livelihood purposes, I will not say commercial, but market purposes, some of these resources are being extracted. And of course, as we move away from the uh, sanctuary area where the mangroves are there, the resource use uh, declines by the people declines. And our studies, actually, we looked at five major functions of mangroves, uh, regula uh, regulating as well as provisioning services of mangroves, of which protection from storms was uh, one of the first function that we looked at. And very interestingly, what we found was of what we found was totally in tune. And this was the first empirical study on storm protection function of mangroves. We did find that where with the villages which were provided protection by mangroves were actually, there was no loss of life reported from there. But what interesting thing that we found because uh, we, uh, Dr. Sadamani did talk about replacing uh, natural ecosystems with human created uh, you know, uh, systems to provide the same services, which is more expensive. But in terms of effectiveness, it was very interesting to see that wherever the villages were protected by the dike, it is the same super cyclone of 1999. There was uh, a lot of loss of property you know, in terms of loss to crops and houses and property of people, because the storm water, once it came into the villages with a huge surge, it did not have the same strength to go out. And the water remained in the villages for two to three weeks. And there was a lot of economic loss. Again, uh, we did uh, another study on nutrient retention functions of mangroves. And it is well known and well documented that man uh, soils on which mangroves are there are very rich in nutrients. And we conducted our study in uh, Bitar Kanika area, both in areas which had mangroves now and in areas from which mangroves had been removed. And we found that the per hectare value of NPK, three uh, important uh, you know, uh, uh, constituents, nut uh, nutrients per hectare, which exceeded in the mangrove soil was very, very high as compared to the areas from which mangroves had been removed. And in fact, uh, we, uh, this paper has been published in uh, Coastal, I I'll just let you know, in one of the, uh, which is that Coastal Science and Estuaries journal and but the interesting part is we had a very tough time in trying to convince regarding this function because we had taken uh, you know these uh, examples from the agriculture producers how much the production was there 
in areas near mangrove forest and in areas afar from mangrove forest without using any kind of chemical fertilizers and we found that the agriculture productivity near the uh, you know in agricultural areas which were located near the mangrove forest was very high as compared to those which were located far away from mangrove forest and ultimately with a lot of to and fro this uh, document was accepted after going through a lot of experts because there are people have different views on this particular function of mangroves apart from that uh, uh, it is uh, again well known that uh, mangroves provide very very important nursery as well as other services for coastal fisheries and in this case we had uh, you know taken the trawler fisheries as well as inshore fisheries in trawler fisheries we found that the fish catch of the uh, coast of gahir matha and uh, was 17 times higher as compared to the fish coast, uh, catch in uh, paradeep areas from where mangroves had been removed and in terms of species also it was much richer as compared to uh, the areas from which mangroves did not exist now the role of inshore fishery which is you know uh, for subsistence purposes and was mainly being followed by the women and children had very very important contribution for the daily livelihood requirements of the local uh, communities who live in those areas and this is the function i was talking about that how agriculture production in uh, uh, you know agriculture lands near and far from mangroves was significantly different and this is documented i'll give you the reference again uh, we also wanted to look at the perception of people how they were perceiving because it was a very difficult situation in uh, bhitar kanika area because people were dependent on these areas but uh, they were only using these resources de facto because it is a protected area and uh, the use is restricted and we really wanted to know how they perceived the ecological services as well as the use values of these mangroves we found that uh, of course protect, protective functions fared very high but as uh, were important the uh, the provisioning services that mangrove forests were providing to these local people and uh, people were willing to cooperate particularly those people who were living in uh, close proximity to these areas were willing to cooperate with the forest department and any agency who wanted to work for this restoration of mangroves provided their own livelihood requirements were uh, you know uh, were uh, secured as well as uh, people who were basically engaged in agriculture and fishing were also more willing to cooperate with Uh, the forest department and other agencies working for mangrove restoration and conservation we found that people were aware of their responsibility but uh, you know uh, as people do not want to go rub the you know the systems in the wrong way they did not admit that they were facing a problem in terms of the protected status of the forest but uh, they they wanted they were aware of the protected status they were willing to cooperate and particularly uh female awareness was very very low as uh, in terms of any kind of committees or initiatives that were taken up uh, for restoration of uh, mangroves or for community participation dr subramaniam has talked about the, their intensive work and excellent work which they have done through community participation but women's participation and awareness remained an issue in these areas similarly when we uh, looked at some of our studies from the other states in terms of perception of local communities people are well aware of this uh, you know community uh, of the important functions uh, of the mangroves to their lives and livelihoods but the only issue is how they are going to participate what are these models what are these decentralized models of participation for the local communities which are available in some of the areas where intensive work has been done by you know agencies such as ms swaminath foundation they have been able to restore and create these institutions but in other places a lot of work in these dimensions continues to remain and if we look at the gaps uh, that exist in terms of research we uh, do not have important indices for different areas uh, in terms either of uh, mangrove species or even of biodiversity 
again we have gaps in utilizing community knowledge for conservation local local knowledge local traditional knowledge again there are few estimates available at the micro level on the types of goods and quantities extracted processed or sold or what value additions are possible and what are being done uh, there are lack of holistic studies in terms of cost and benefit analysis of communities from different parts of the country in terms of uh, technology although we do have platforms for coordination in terms of mff program or the you know the uh, the bay of bengal uh, program for coordination but a lot of impact of these coordination international level coordination at the grassroots level remains to be seen there is a, uh, we uh, there is a lot of scope for transfer uh, technology transfer to the communities for adoption of alternate livelihoods uh, you know the government agencies such as uh, department of science and technology have taken very very important initiatives for transfer of technologies for livelihood enhancement and uh, ecosystem maintenance for other ecosystems but there is a huge gap in their work in terms of the mangrove ecosystem again advanced use of advanced technology in ecological studies and few technological intervention in dissemination of information we still rely on the disaster the background in fact um, i'm aware of dr sodamani's excellent work in terms of role of you know uh, information dissemination technology for such uh, uh, ecosystem i think she's done it for disaster but if we were to do it as a normal course of action and we have a lot of example i mean we have excellent example from our country what we can achieve by proper technology transfer in terms of awareness which would require in such areas not only advanced technology but revival of traditional technologies for community awareness and all these information failures actually result in a policy gap which is still a lack of coordination unclear policy objective at different tiers and departments of governments again lack of uh, uh, systematic involvement of local communities in uh, decision making still a gap in accounting of income generated uh, by mangroves in state level uh, and uh, national statistics and again no clear linkages uh, of ecosystem services with human well being and social economic value may be the only few studies that dr sadamani has been able to demonstrate and the studies uh, by the uh, ms uh, swaminathan foundation but a huge gap still exists so we uh, probably among other things we need to uh, you know work at various levels at the community level identification of resource use groups with varying dependency appropriate institutional models for benefit sharing etc harnessing the positive attitudes even when they are fence sitters is very important and involvement of women again mangrove restoration using advanced technology in terms of awareness and a reduction of biotic pressures on these particular habitats cooperation with international partners preparation of scientific management plans we do have management plans existing for almost all these areas working plans but how much it involves the role of policy makers and stakeholders we really need to critically examine and more research on the productivity of the mangrove dependent system and their contribution to the economy so thank you and with this we remain open to questions thank you professor vadala this was a very very good presentation and i really like how you kind of identified the sort of gap areas uh, some of the failures in information and technology which lead to policy failures and then you have highlighted the, the way forward that 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 is what uh, we are here to to discuss these and deliberate upon uh, we have crunch of time like yesterday i was thinking i will do better but uh, all the presentations and information were interesting and it didn't feel like we can cut short but we have some time to to have discussion and some uh, questions most of the questions in qa box have already been answered so i thank all the resource people for taking time for typing and answering those questions live uh well, once again i like all of our speakers and panel members for a very interesting uh, presentations and information sharing um to to start the discussion uh for, for for a limited duration that we have now um i'll like to go back to uh to mr vasudevan 
uh, because there was a <clears throat> Uh, comment or a question from one of the panel members uh, who could not post it on QA box. And uh, uh, this was from Minakshi. Uh, would you like to ask your question, Minakshi? Or should I, do you want me to, to ask for you? I can go ahead and ask. Um, yes, please so go the ahead. question was uh, to Mr. Vasudevan about the about the legal status of like mangrove trees in India. Um, so I was just wondering, uh, because I read in the CRZ, but probably this was an earlier notification that uh, it mangroves come under zone one and hence they're not allowed to be cut. Um, what is the current status of this? And does this mean that there's no, um, well, like mangroves are not allowed to be cut at all or and what happens if mangroves are growing in private land or revenue land how does the forest department um intervene in such cases okay. or i mean it can be addressed to any uh, resource person here i i don't see him here so maybe he I stepped out yeah Please go I ahead. could just comment on this because what I uh, understand from this is it depends on the status of the land on which the mangroves are there. If it is a for, it, if it is a protected area, then of course nothing is allowed. If it is a forest area, it again depends on what is permissible. If it is a reserve forest or a protected forest, whatever is permissible or not. And if it is private land, then of course the tree act of the state would apply. That is my understanding. But if anybody can add. Onto this uh, private ownership is a major issue in Kerala, Karnataka, as well as in Maharashtra. Actually, you know, in Kerala, uh, one BFO, he purchased the private lands for the forest department and started uh, uh, protecting them. So like that, uh, it is very difficult uh, to grab the private land and unless otherwise you know we we give some uh, money or uh, without incentives uh, it is very difficult to purchase by the forest department this is the current state right. thank you yeah. so thank, thank, thank you for for linking question uh, dr rupesh um so like in the case of uh, andaman islands where there was uh, subsidence because of the tsunami uh, there is like mangrove uh, recolonization in some of these sub subsided lands. Um, so in this case, it's growing in like people's agricultural fields um, that were once there, like uh, functional agricultural fields. Um, but then at the same time, the island protection zone notification uh, says that like these are areas that should be protected. Um, so I, yeah, it's a bit confusing in terms of the gap of uh, both policy knowledge and um, on-ground implementation. So this is where the origin of my question comes from. Thank you, Minakshi. Um, yeah, that, that's a, a very interesting question. And I actually saw that firsthand very recently during my last visit to Andaman Highlands uh, for a sampling trip. And uh, Dr. Nehru can perhaps uh, say something. He has a much longer experience about Andaman Islands on this one. But my understanding is that the, the previous farmlands or agricultural farms, which got subsided and mangroves are coming up. In those cases, there was some, I cannot vouch for the efficiency of the process, but some sort of reset, uh, like, you know, settlement happened. Government did provide some compensation for those farm uh, owners whose land was subsided uh, or, or hence, made unproductive uh, we can talk about whether it was a fair compensation how good it was done and all those things but there was this process and once that is sort of settled then they they do not have an ownership of that land and then uh, whatever the, the norms are regulations are uh, under the coastal zone protection or mangroves that can take place uh, however i do know not everyone uh, agreed uh, in terms of getting that compensation and they still all that land. So th this is a little bit complex issue, but uh, Dr. Nehru wants to add something to that. 
yeah like uh, rupesh has mentioned it's a kind of a complex issue and uh, uh, more or less it is uh, even some people have given up their land and got the compensation but as far as my understanding goes they when others who did not claim the compensation they also joins with them to reclaim their lands so and uh, there is a probably a gap in implementation of policy so that may be pretty much uh, common in many places as well um uh, so as far as in andaman those who haven't got their compensation uh the policy is still kind of it's in a kind of a gray area so it's like there is no um, clear steps have been taken so uh, the, the the situations in mainland india could be quite different than how it is in in uh, andaman because this is a kind of a very unique situation where crop lands or uh, human settlements were taken over and it has become into tidal whereas in the mainland you don't at least see that kind of situation or you don't have the uh, land use what what this land is so in andaman you have a lands that are still you know you don't know where to put them in the records so you don't have the issues in the mainland so the issues in mainland are quite different yeah thank you dr mary uh i think we can continue with our conversation it's an exciting topic and we all are mango lovers so i know time time is not crunch essentially for us but for a lot of participants and and a lot of busy people i know we need to uh, come to a closure of this interesting session so what i'll do is i will quickly do a wrap up of today uh, and then uh, we will call it uh, a closure and we have to meet again tomorrow to continue our discussion so this will give us some time for reflection so today's theme was mangroves for coastal resilience and biodiversity conservation this is where we wanted to sort of bring together some voices people who are working in mangrove uh, ecosystems these coastal areas uh, on aspects which are not directly focusing on carbon sequestration and i think we did it very successive successfully we had a, a wide variety diversity of speakers talks experiences covering not only uh, biodiversity aspects from say benthic to pelagic in dr punsil of padri's talk but also about the social economic aspects that was covered by our uh, speakers as well, uh, in their talks as well as in the uh, panel discussion um we started off with a very good uh, welcome address by professor sivu kumar and he presented his own personal anecdote uh, uh, from his visits and his work uh, which was very encouraging he also identified some of the key aspect when uh, uh, you know um, at a landscape level water is dammed or fresh water supply is curtailed it not only hampers the shoreline environment because of fresh water uh, uh, diminishing fresh water supply but also uh, suffocates the life because the essential nutrients are also trapped and that has implications on biodiversity on livelihoods the whole food cycle the food chain and food web in the ecosystem so with that with that great start then we moved on to our keynote speaker dr uh, uh, vasudevan sir who has uh, um, a great uh, uh, experience working in in working or we say establishing the mangrove the only mangrove settlement in india in maharashtra and he continued there for 8 years and uh, although he was very modest in claiming this as success story but we all know it was a great success story in terms of increasing the mangrove cover in maharashtra what are the the legal uh, and policy and institutional changes that has to be made or creative solutions have to be derived to achieve that so this provides a good primer for other states or uh, even countries how do you tackle those complex uh, issues because as such these uh, landscape these coastal seascapes are uh, heavily populated in many 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 places and a lot of uh, services or benefits are derived by people so there are these contesting claims on these resources and how do you tackle them sometimes with the good political support it seems easy but it it takes time to to gather that political support to to drive that confidence and then carry on this so uh, we thank uh, mr vasudevan for sharing that story Uh, then we had uh, our uh, first speaker uh, professor punsil padri from icer kolkata and he delved deeper into the complexity at the biological level uh, looking uh, sort of at a 
at a at a finer detail level, I would say microscopic to a little bit macroscopic level, connecting the benthic and pelagic organism, how these flow of nutrients energy uh, uh, occurs at the juncture of this where fresh water meets the coastal and in this this very productive ecosystem that's where uh, the mangroves thrive uh, and he shared his examples from his work from uh, Sundarbans and he highlighted the importance of uh, long-term time series data if we need to understand these ecosystems in a better way in a holistic manner we need to not just uh, have one or two uh, you know sampling event taking snapshot, but a long-term monitoring of these systems, how these systems are changing, how they, the organisms are behaving uh, across the seasons or at an annual or biannual level. And if we have a good time series data, he showed a graph on salinity, uh, which is an important predictor of a lot of functions in that area. So those kind of efforts need to be taken. Then we have a recorded presentation from Dina Rescuana. She's a doctoral student, and she talked about the importance of mangroves taking us to Bitter Kanika uh, area. Bitter Kanika and Gahid Matha Sanctuary, that part of uh, Eastern India, Orissa, uh, factored quite a lot in today's uh, discussions, which is which is very good because that's the area I personally visited and also conducted some work, so very close to my heart. And she shared uh, the important value of uh, uh, mangroves uh, as a firewood a provider of firewood or fuel wood and other uh, uses that it is used. Uh, she highlighted three important aspects. One is the livelihood security. Second is the conservation value. And then strong sense of space or place uh, for the people's perception toward mangroves. Then uh, we moved on to our panel discussion where first talk was by Professor Sodamini Das. And uh, her pioneer, pioneering work in putting an economic value of mangrove is legendary, as was highlighted a couple of times, uh, that we hardly see good number of studies putting uh, uh, some values, economic valuation of these mangroves, what kind of security or what kind of uh, uh, role they play in, in events like uh, super cyclone of uh, Orisa, and how uh, learning uh, or you know um, knowing more about wind pattern, wind damage uh, caused by cyclone and how mangroves can protect against that uh, gives us a good understanding, a solid foundation for policymakers to to formulate uh, protection and conservation laws for mangroves. Then Dr. Uh, Ramasubramanian. Uh, presented some of his experience and learnings from the practical aspect of restoring mangroves. So he started off with some of the reasons how mangroves can be degraded, destroyed, anthropogenic, as well as sometimes natural causes. Uh, natural causes which are highlighted due to climate change, which is the, because of anthropogenic reasons. So, uh, and, and, and some of the successful areas of restoring mangrove sites, how do you, identify which are the sites where restoration should place uh, should take place and what needs to be done how do you mobilize community how do you find ways to generate livelihood option for the community while you are restoring mango so looking this as more a sociological uh, complex system not just looking uh, mango individually and then lastly we had uh, uh, professor Dola from wfii and uh, she highlighted the provisioning and regulatory services. Many ways for uh, sustaining the communities that live in these coastal environment. Uh, the economic valuation of mangrove services therefore provides a very good reason to formulate uh, policies that are helpful in long-term sustenance of these coastal environments. She highlighted some of the technological and, and, and knowledge gaps and how we can address them to, to basically uh, address the policy level gaps so to make informed decisions to ensure that mangroves are accounted in national accounting, the incomes that they, uh, that, uh, uh, they provide, uh, the services they provide are not, not forgotten. So we had a 
a very sort of wholesome uh, presentation and uh, a good amount of discussion, I believe, in question and answer, uh, in the form of question and answer. A lot of interesting questions were asked, a lot of uh, responses provided. So I, I feel uh, this is a very good second day. And uh, I before concluding this, this day, I would like to thank all participants for their active engagement and participation, asking questions and trying to show their interest in learning more about the information and the knowledge about mangroves. I also like to thank all our speakers and panel members for their time, their contributions, sharing their wisdom and knowledge. And I like to say that we have one more day uh, of this uh, interesting discussions tomorrow. Tomorrow's theme will be about recent advances in mangrove research in future perspective. So we'll try to look from the, uh, the lens of what we know already and uh, what we still need to know. So what are the directions we need to, uh, to follow to advance our understanding of these ecosystems and how do we forge new collaborations, new partnerships, and how do we address some of the challenges that lies in front to achieve that successfully. So with that, I would like to thank everyone and I will uh, call this uh, today's session to a close. Thank you all.